Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to talk to you about in the land of sports, and we definitely want to keep that conversation rolling after the show. So, Pad, where does everybody head on over to? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over there. You get subscribed to all the social media accounts so we can keep that conversation going. A lot of stuff has been picking up lately after the show, and I love seeing that, too, as well. And you can also check out the T Public Store link, which rumor has it a sale is dropping this week. And I always tell everybody, if you're going to support the show in that way, go buy stuff when it's on sale. Seriously. It, I, it, I'm just happy to see it out in the world. And mm-hmm. we and a lot of people are buying Parlay Club shirts. So definitely love seeing that. Also, check out the Patreon link, which one tier, $2 a month, and a bonus episode is coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned for that, dot, dot, dot. The blog section, where we always got reviews dropping. The classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and so many more. The directory, which, Pat, how many providers are we on? 912,000. Sounds about right to me. I don't argue about that anymore. Pat keeps so fine-tuned track of that. So if we're not on your favorite podcast player, I don't know how you're listening to us, but please let us know, and we'll get we'll make sure we get that all loaded up there for you. Allegedly, we're working on ham radio. Allegedly. We have heard this, so we're trying to figure out how that's all happening. The music section, basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHPod. Kicking off the sports edition of the show, it's football season. Yeah, it is. What else are we going to start with other than we won of the NFL recap? I know I messed that up, but I'm still feeling the effects of Monday night. I am not shying away from that lead. We will talk about that game when it comes to. But if you are familiar with the show, and I hope you are, you know it's locks and leaps season. So we break down one game that we pick as a lock, and then one game we pick as a leap, and then break down everything else that happened in the week that was. So, Pad, kick us off. Yeah, so we're going to start with my lock. I chose the Washington Commanders to defeat the Arizona Cardinals because, hey, the Cardinals suck. Kyler Murray's not there, and no disrespect to Joshua Dobbs, but you ain't it. Uh, and I did come out uh, correctly with the Washington Commanders winning by the final score of 20-16. to 16. Sam Howell uh, led Washington in passing with 19-31 for 202 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, Joshua Dobbs for Arizona, 21-30, of 30, 132 yards passing, no touchdowns or interceptions. Brian Robinson Jr. led Washington in rushing with 19 carries, 59 yards, no touchdowns, uh, 14 carries, 62 yards, and no touchdowns for James Conner over on Arizona's side. Uh, For Arizona, Rondell Moore led the team in receiving with three catches, 33 yards, no touchdowns. And for Washington, it was Curtis Samuel leading the way with five catches, 54 yards, and no touchdowns. Well... This game went the way we thought it was going to go, but it did not go the way I thought it was going to go, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I felt Washington, being at home with a new ownership team in place, was going to come out and really make a statement. Uh, Fans certainly turned out. I'm looking at the box score on ESPN.com, which, uh, nicely enough, on the right side of the screen, provides the attendance. Uh, 64,693 folks in attendance. A 96% attendant, uh, uh, attendance. So uh, kudos to you fans. You turned out. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a new era in Washington, and, and fans that have been waiting for this day to happen finally got their wish and showed up. Yeah. And that's great. I love seeing that. But where I think it went different is Arizona, which we said on the preview show uh, for the NFL, which you haven't listened to, make sure you go check that out, is the worst team in the NFL. Yes, they are. So the fact that Washington only won by four is a little troublesome to me. Mm -hmm. But it's week one. 
It's wait and see, dot, dot, dot. West Coast team coming east, uh, you know, a rookie head coach. You know, their, their, their head coach is, I had to look this up because I know Ron Rivera is still there in Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, but their Arizona's head coach is a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Gannon, who in the NFL was a defensive quality control coach in 2007 for Atlanta. Then he was in Tennessee for a spell, also in the same position. Uh, in Minnesota from 2014 to 2017 as the assistant defensive backs coach. Indianapolis from 2018 to 2020 as the defensive backs coach, uh, was the defensive coordinator for the Eagles in 2021 to 2022, and now he's the new head coach. So obviously a little bit of pressure on him, Mm -hmm. but not enough, I would say, is like overwhelming. Also an unenviable position just because... I wouldn't say Arizona is one of those teams that like expects greatness, mm-hmm. Super Bowl or bust. Anything less than a Super Bowl is a failure. But that's certainly like you and I know a couple of Cardinals fans. They're they're pretty diehard folks. They like to see their team do well, and I'm sure all Cardinal fans want to see their team do team do well. I don't envy the position the head coach is in just because he's inheriting a lot of shit. Oh yeah, you, you know there's there's not a lot of good on that team. Marquise Brown's good. You know, Rondell Moore is not bad. Zach Ertz is obviously a decent player, but let's face it, he's, you know, on the back half of his career. And listen, Kyler Murray, it depends on the schedule for Call of Duty, whether he's going to show up or not. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's got a mountain to work with, you know, in terms of like to summit and get over before he can get to the proverbial promised land, whatever that is. You know, and I wish him all the luck because, goddamn, dude, you're going to need it. You know, but for Washington, hey, it was a good, you know, turn of the page from all the nonsense and the BS from the last couple of years. No, absolutely. I think Arizona has really struggled to find an identity as head coach since Mm -hmm. the Ken Wisenhunt days. God, yeah. I mean, let's be honest. The Kingsbury experiment did not work out well. No, it didn't. So here we are. So, yeah, I mean, the expectations are very low. And with the talent in comparison to the other teams in the league. The bar is very, very low. Mm-hmm. For Washington, it's a little higher because Eric Benemy is now the offensive coordinator. I will say they did look a little better than we have seen yeah. Washington run in previous yeah. years. Yeah. Obviously, it's still game one. But there's still a lot of good things that happen for Washington. I just thought that they would have taken advantage of the emotion of being home mm-hmm. and put up more points. Yeah, you would have you would have figured. But, hey, first week, Jitters, two relatively young teams. Uh, mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of promise moving forward. I think that Sam Howell looked good as quarterback, yeah. I mean, 19 for 31, 202 and one. Yeah, that's that's not a bad stat no. line walking in, but it's now what you do moving forward. That's going to be the biggest question. Yeah, like we said, uh, said last week, uh, he's a sophomore in his sophomore season coming out of UNC, so a decent decent stat line for him. Yeah. Uh, looking at the Washington Commanders schedule for the next couple of weeks, uh, next week they're on the road playing the Denver Broncos in Denver, then they are at home playing the Buffalo Bills, and then they are on the road playing the Philadelphia Eagles, so definitely not an enviable stretch for them. Uh, and then on the flip side for the Arizona Cardinals, uh, the next couple of weeks they are uh, at home playing the New York Giants, uh, this upcoming week. After that, they are at home playing the Dallas Cowboys, and then they are finally uh, they're back on the road, I should say, uh, playing the San Francisco 49ers. So I think if the Giants are going to win a game, I think next week is probably the biggest one on their schedule thus far. Uh, yeah, let's put it this way. Early prediction, uh, they're not going to get shut out of that game. No, definitely not. But moving to your leap Pat. yeah uh this one i couldn't believe was a leap. this one like this team was not favored uh, it was hard to believe i get it was an away game a divisional game whatever else but could not believe it uh i chose the las vegas raiders who were underdogs to beat the denver broncos which they did by the final score of 17 to 16 uh jimmy g uh 20 of 20 or 20 of 26 for 200 yards two touchdowns one interception uh russell wilson Let's ride. Uh, 27 to 34 for 177 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Josh Jacobs led Vegas in rushing with 19 carries, 48 yards, no touchdowns. Javante Williams led Denver in rushing, 13 carries, 52 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, For receiving, uh, Samaji Perrine led Denver in receiving, four catches, 37 yards, no touchdowns. And then for receiving, Jacoby Myers, of all people, go figure, uh, led Vegas in receiving with nine catches, 81 yards, two touchdowns. Well, two stories from this one. Mm-hmm. The Sean Payton era started off, and I would say if you have to give it a grade, put it about a five, six, maybe. Uh, yeah, five, six. Although I got to give him like a half bonus point for calling a fucking onside kick to start the game. Well, you know what? I think man's he, got some stones. He wanted to set the tempo early. 
You can't fault him on that. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we always say here on the ODPH is when it's division, you really know the teams are going to step up. Mm -hmm. And the Raiders and Broncos have had a great rivalry over the years. The Raiders are in this very unique place where, on paper, they should be doing great. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Garoppolo coming in is an upgrade from Derek Carr. What were we going to get? Mm -hmm. Well, it started out a little slow, in my opinion. Yeah, only 7-6 uh, after the first quarter. And then, what is it, 10 to 13, 13 at halftime? Yeah. So the offense did not click right away. Mm -hmm. But what I thought is, as the game progressed, I thought the Raiders hung in there. Mm -hmm. When Russell Wilson was trying to pull that Seattle Magic back out, I thought the Raiders stepped up and made some key plays. And I think right. that... If you're a Raiders fan, and I know Rich from 3FN is leading the charge with this, this team really surprised everybody. Yeah. And I think that with Jimmy G coming in, the offense ran smoothly. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the greatest show on turf, so to speak. No. But he moved the chains. They, they hung in there. They got a gritty win. And it's something to build momentum on moving forward because a lot of people wrote the Raiders off for dead. Sean Payton coming back to league, and everybody thought that this would be the new dynasty of, of Denver. And I'm sorry, Broncos fans. He has a lot of work to do. He does, yeah. Before you can start crowning them the kings of the AFC West again. Right. No, I think a lot of teams were certainly counting the Raiders third and in some instances maybe fourth because, I mean, honestly, let's face it, we'll get to it later, but obviously everyone – I think outside of, you know, the cities of Vegas, Los Angeles, and Denver, we're picking the Chiefs to win the division. After that, I think a lot of people would have put the Chargers in second place. And then depending on where you live, you know, you would have had either the Raiders in third, Broncos in fourth, or vice versa, depending on where you live. So the fact that, like, as we sit here and record, the Raiders are in first place of, of the AFC West. And, mm -hmm. and you got to give them credit and you got to give them kudos for that. You know, Denver, not the best game you've ever had, but it's it's Sean Payton coming into not necessarily as bad a situation as, as the head coaching in Arizona is, but like it ain't much better. Right. You know, you got a decent quarterback with Russell Wilson, and a, and a lot of people might go, well, how can you say he's not a great quarterback? Look at, look at him the last you know, year, two years. He's regressed. He's regressed. He's not the Russell Wilson that was pulling off the magic in his run to the Super Bowl, you know, whether he won in the Super Bowl, he lost. You know, this isn't the same guy. I mean, I look at the guys on the stat line, you know, for for the offense, and none of these guys scare the shit out of me. You mm -hmm. know, the, this ain't like the one year he was there where he had DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, and I went, fuck, that's scary. Yeah. You know, I'm looking, Javante Williams, Samaji Perrine. Uh, and receiving, you have Adam Troutman, Cortland Sutton, Brandon Johnson, Greg Dulcich, uh, uh, Lil Jordan Humphrey, Marvin Mims Jr., My Michael Burton, Philip Dorsett, uh, Jal uh, Jaleel McLaughlin. Like, I know everyone's got their fantasy drafts done. Did you pick any of those folks up in your fantasy drafts? Be honest. If you did, provide a screenshot. Because, listen, Russell is a fine quarterback, and he's going to get the job done, provided he can stay upright and he can connect a pass and those guys can catch it. But that receiving core needs work. That running back core needs work. And I'll even say this, probably the O-line needs some work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, period. So the fact this game was that close, it just goes to show about division rivalries. Right. And that's the big takeaway here. But I think the one headline that needs to get more praise is the Raiders winning. Yeah. Because we honestly were not sure what to expect from this team. Jimmy G coming off an injury from last mm -hmm. year, throwing for 200 yards, two touchdowns. Yeah, yeah, he had the one interception, but yeah, that's going to happen. He looked great. He looked great. I mean, Josh Jacobs, a little bit of a down game, but hey, first game jitters, you know, whatever else. And, and hell, I'll admit it, I'm surprised Jacoby Myers led the team in receiving because the Patriots, you know, basically wrote him off and... Yeah, he was good for being QB, too, mm -hmm. you know, and the trick plays McDaniels like to run, and that's what I figured he'd do out in Vegas. But the fact that, hey, kudos to him for 81 yards receiving and two touchdowns. Yeah, so you can't fault him on that. It's a big win. It's a momentum yeah. booster because for being considered an underdog this season, they came out swinging. So, yeah. you know, kudos to them. Yeah. Uh, and looking at their schedules the next couple of weeks for the Raiders, they are on the road playing the Buffalo Bills next week. Uh, week three, they are at home playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then week four, they are on the road playing the Los Angeles Chargers. As for those Denver Broncos, next week they are at home playing the Washington Commanders, as I mentioned. Uh, week three, they're on the road playing the Miami Dolphins. And then week four they're on the road playing the chicago bears 
So teams are going to be doing some traveling, a little bit of work that both teams need to do. I think yeah. next week for the Raiders is going to be a real test. Yeah. I'm um, not saying that because obviously I'm part of Bill's Mafia, but I think that that's going to be a real serious litmus test to see where they're at. Yep. Because every game is not going to be like my lock that we're going to talk about. <laughs> oh, boy. Because the Baltimore Ravens Yo. did what – I thought they were going to do, and then some. Uh huh. Pad, let's talk about it. Yeah. So the Baltimore Ravens won by the final score of twenty-five to nine. Lamar Jackson seventeen to twenty-two for one hundred and sixty-nine yards passing, no touchdowns uh, throwing, one interception throwing. Uh, for Houston, C.J. Stroud obviously led the team in passing, twenty-eight to forty-four, two hundred and forty-two yards passing, no touchdowns or interceptions. Uh, Lamar Jackson led Baltimore in rushing because surprise, surprise, mm-hmm. uh, he had six carries, thirty-eight yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Damian Pierce led Houston in rushing with 11 carries, 38 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Nico Collins led Houston in receiving with six catches, 80 yards, no touchdowns. And then Zay Flowers led Baltimore in receiving with nine catches, uh, 78 yards, and no touchdowns. Well, this game went the way we thought it was going to go. Yep. Houston has a lot of work to do. If it wasn't for Arizona, arguably probably the worst team in the NFL. Mm Mm-hmm. And... Obviously, with getting such high draft picks, you knew they were in a rebuilding phase. Yep. C.J. Stroud did not look great. No, but the stat line, not bad. Stat line is not bad. He got sacked five times. Right. So, I'm not writing him off just no. yet. No, God. The Baltimore defense is still the Baltimore defense. Like I say, it's not mm-hmm. the Ray Lewis era, but it's still a good defense. Mm-hmm. And I think it was going to be a real tough challenge for him to debut. I think that there's a lot of work he can definitely do because – where they started out decent in the first half, they were ice cold in the second half. Mm-hmm. And this is where Baltimore took their best shot. And remember, it was only 7-6 at halftime. Yep. And then Lamar Jackson turned it on for 15 in the third <laughs> quarter. Yeah. So And Houston only scored three points the entire second half. Yeah. So when you think about it, Let's say Lamar and Baltimore turned it on in that second half, doing a combined 18. Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong with what you saw there. It's Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of what are they going to do now? Obviously losing J.K. Dobbins for the season. Yeah, which, you know, sucks for them. But then again, you also have Lamar. So nine times out of ten, Lamar is going to be your leading rusher every week. It's just it's nice to have that running back to fall back on, you know, because, hey, let's face it. Lamar can't throw and pass, throw and run every single down. Mm -hmm. And that's something that if they want to sustain a deep run in the playoffs, he shouldn't be. No. So I don't know who's available they can go get. I know a lot is going to be asked to Gus Edwards, but somebody's going to have to step up and take some of the workload off him. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to wait and see about that. But I thought for, you know, the drama that was last year of him and his contract situation gone. Yeah. I thought Lamar looked great. Yeah, it was a good solid yeah. open it was a good solid opening for him. And I'll even say this for Stroud, you know, was it a great game for him? No, but it was for a rookie coming into Baltimore, which that defense has been good for years. Mm-hmm. That offense has been good for years. And let's face it, who the hell, like we said in the previous show, who the hell does he have to throw to on that team? Oh, exactly. I mean, okay, Nico Collins, congratulations, eighty yards. Robert Woods, fifty seven yards. Noah Brown, twenty yards. You know, but then the rest of them are like Dalton Schultz, four yards. Like he's got nobody to throw to. So you know, I I expected less just because it's Baltimore. But the mm. fact, hey, you got 200 yards on Baltimore's defense as a rookie in your first game, not bad, kid. No, definitely not bad. A lot to work on. And this year, the bar is set very, very low. Mm-hmm. So this game went the way I thought it was going to go. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a little more high scoring on Baltimore's end. But it is what it is. Mm-hmm. I think their big takeaway is when Dobbins went down, Yeah. Zay Flowers stepped up. Mm-hmm. He looked great. OBJ looked okay. OBJ with the uh, uncanny impression of Ray Lewis. Yes. So, so, I mean, but, you know, I think that he's very comfortable in Baltimore. And if he can mentor. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Like, it, there was a little bit of swagger there, and I love seeing that, especially with Baltimore. And is, and a lot of teams are, or people are writing them off because of Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. But Baltimore is going to hang in there. And if they play like this, they're going to be a team to watch. I think Baltimore is a great position for OBJ to be in just because there's not a lot of high expectations for them this year mm-hmm. with the Kansas Cities and the Buffaloes and the Miamis and, well, 
Jets up until, you know, yesterday. Yeah. You know, but then all the other teams, you know, the, the Chargers and what have you. And, and then you, that's even before you get to the NFC teams that like Baltimore is not expected to go real far this year. So it's perfect for him having coming back from that injury. You know, what's he still got? He can ball out, not go crazy, you know, but it's so it's good for him and, and good win for Baltimore. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of Baltimore and their schedule, uh, looking up at the next couple of weeks, this upcoming Sunday, they're on the road taking on the Cincinnati Bengals next week. After that, they're at home against the Indianapolis Colts, and then they are on the road playing the Cleveland Browns in week four. Uh, looking to the Houston Texans, they are at home against the Indianapolis Colts this upcoming Sunday. Then they are on the road playing the Jacksonville Jaguars, and then they're back home uh, on the 1st of October playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. So a lot of good games for both teams moving forward. Houston's got to do some rebounding. Baltimore just has to keep playing consistent. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the big thing. Yeah. Then we go to my leap. Mm -hmm. And this game was a surprise. Yeah. I took a little roll of the dice, if you will, with this because it's been a, one of the other NFL's greatest rivalries. Yes. Since the, the inception of the league. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I like Justin Fields, but I'm not sold on the Bears as a whole. I looked at this game and I thought about taking it as a leap, but I'm like, I just don't know how this is going to go. Mm -hmm. and, the, and Green Bay, with all the drama removed from their situation, the bar is set very low for them. Mm hmm. But did they ever decide to show up as an underdog? Oof. Oh, my God. Let's Oof. talk about it. Yeah, so Green Bay won by a final score of 38 to 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jordan Love, 15 of 27 for 245 yards passing, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Justin Fields, 24 of 37 for 216 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, Aaron Jones led Green Bay in rushing with nine carries, 41 yards, one touchdown. Justin Fields led Chicago in rushing with nine carries, 59 yards, no touchdowns. Aaron Jones also led Green Bay in receiving with two catches, 86 yards, one touchdown. Uh, and then Darnell Mooney led Chicago in receiving with four catches, 53 yards, and one touchdown. Talk about a tale of two teams. Oof. So let's start with the positives here. Mm -hmm. Green Bay, <coughs> how are you feeling today? They're feeling the love. Oh, my God. This Literally. was this was a huge surprise. It was for me, too, yeah. You know, not going to lie about it. I figured Green Bay might pull out the win. Mm -hmm. be, you know, might come down to their uh, new kicker they got there. Uh, Jordan, a uh, gentleman by the name of, looking it up now, uh, kicking uh, Anders Carlson, who is the first gentleman to attempt a PAT or field goal for Green Bay, not named Mason Crosby, since 2006. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. That long? Yeah, that Holy. long. Yeah, so I figured it might come down to their new kicker they got there, but I, I did not see it being an 18-point difference in the spread. No, I definitely didn't see that happening, especially division rivalry game. Yeah. I, I thought it was going to be closer. I don't blame this on Justin Fields. I credit this to the Green Bay offense. Mm -hmm. And Jordan Love, I'm not saying he copied Aaron Rodgers, but I'm going to say he got the ball around mm -hmm. to a lot of receivers. Yeah, he did. And he kept everybody engaged for the most part. Yeah, two catches to Aaron Jones, three to Luke Musgrave, two to Jaden Reed, uh, four to Romeo Dobbs, uh, two to Samori Toure, two to A.J. Dillon, uh, and then he targeted uh, De Dontavian Wicks twice, and he tar targeted Malik Heath once. Both of those gentlemen did not catch, though. Right. But he's still spread. That's very even spread. That's not like one guy has like 10 catches. Everybody else has got like three. Exactly. And this is one that Love wanted to make sure that he established his own tempo with the team. Mm -hmm. They did. But really, it came down to Aaron Jones taking over the game. The Green Bay rushing in general, yeah, because you while well, Aaron Jones has got the sexy stat line, uh, A.J. Dillon did have 13 carries for 19 yards. Mm -hmm. So a total between all Green Bay rushers who even attempted or carried the ball, there were 32 rushes on uh, Green Bay side. Yeah, so their offense looked great. Which is wild. Mm -hmm. Definitely did not see this. I would say, arguably, this is one of the biggest surprises uh -huh. of week one. Because you look at everything that Green Bay has lost, in the last couple of seasons, and especially last year with the last offseason with Aaron Rodgers going to New York and basically fleecing the team for all of their receivers. Mm -hmm. It was a case of like, okay, Jordan's there. Can he perform? But even if he performs, who the fuck has he got to throw it to? Exactly. Clearly it didn't matter because he, oh, he throws to everybody. Exactly. And on the flip side, I don't blame this on Justin Fields. No. Uh, three, uh, two, 216 and one. 
uh, you know, had the one interception, which ain't bad. You know, no, not necessarily on him. I'd put it more on Chicago's defense, really not being able to hold down the Packers. That's the biggest problem. Because if you take a look at the stat line and you really break it down, Justin Fields, top rusher. Yeah, top rusher. Uh, Khalil Herbert matched him in carries, but he was uh, thirty about 30 yards short of matching him in yards. Mm -hmm. Not ideal. Uh, Also not ideal is I'm looking at the sack stat line for uh, old Jordan Love. One sack for uh, like eight yards. Yeah. It was not pretty for him. No. And like I say, he's been a one-man team for quite some time now. Mm Mm-hmm. So... Chicago has to give him some balance. Yeah. And that defense did not do it. I'm not taking a shot at Tremont Edmonds, but I know he's now the big focal point of that team. Right. They do have an adequate defense. They just got punched in the mouth, and they didn't know how to react. I mean, the, the Chicago defense gave up basically rum, rum, rounding up here, rounding down, whatever. They gave up 300 yards of offense. Mm-hmm. You know, 245 on passing, 92 on, rush, on rushing. So if you're going to give up north of 300 yards – you need to have the offense back it up and do it. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and clearly they just couldn't because you only had the one touchdown from Chicago rushing. That was Rashawn Johnson, uh, who had five carries, 20 yards, one touchdown. And then for receiving, it was only the one touchdown, from, you know, Darnell Mooney. You're, if you're going to give up 300 yards of offense on your defense, your, your offense needs to get more than two touchdowns. Absolutely. So that's where the problem lies. So Chicago still needs to do some work. Uh huh. I mean, and I, somebody else has to step up and help Justin Fields. That's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what needs to happen. Yeah. I don't know who's going to be the guy to do it, but they have to find out quick. Well, I mean, that's why they brought in DJ Moore is to give Fields another weapon, and everyone figured it'd be another weapon for him. But then you look at the stat line, two catches, 25 yards, no touchdowns, and he was only targeted twice. But you know the thing about it is they were game planning for him. Yeah, that's true. And DJ Moore is a good receiver, but is he a number one? Mm Mm-hmm. He's borderline yeah. at this stage. Yeah. But I think that when you know that he's the only option on this team, and right. I'm sorry, Ch- Chicago, please let me know if I'm saying anything wrong. If he's the only option on your team, you're going to game plan for him. Right. And then you're making Cole Clement be- beat you? Cole Clement, five catches, 44 yards, no touchdowns. He was targeted seven times, so that's not bad. I mean, I'm looking at some of the other names I recognize, though. Uh, Deonta Foreman, two catches, eight yards. He was targeted three times. Chase Claypool, uh, zero catches, zero yards. He was only targeted twice. Mm-hmm. So somebody needs to have a game, mm-hmm. and that's the big problem that you had against your rival. You didn't. No. So now looking at what you have coming up, you have to make some adjustments real quick. You have to brush off this loss, Uh and you have to get back to basics. Yeah, you do. Uh, And for the Chicago Bears, they do not have long to kind of figure this out because they got to get their you-know-what together quick uh, because this upcoming week they're on the road playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, Week after that, they're on the road playing the Kansas City Chiefs. And then uh, fourth week, they are at home against the Denver Broncos. So that is not an easy stretch for them by no. any sense of the imagination. I'm looking at their schedule. It is not going to get any easy anytime soon for them. Flip side for Green Bay Packers, though. Uh, going to look real good for you guys. Uh, this upcoming week, they're on the road playing the Atlanta Falcons. After that, they're at home against the New Orleans Saints. And then they are at home against the Detroit Lions uh, for the next couple of weeks. That Detroit game will be a lot better than people are giving it credit for right now. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's also going to be on Thursday Night Football on Prime Video. Good, because, you know, that deserves a primetime spotlight. Uh-huh. Just saying it right now. So both teams are going to definitely have a uh, tale of the tape, if you will, moving uh-huh. forward. Chicago needs some kind of spark to yeah. its offense, and their defense really needs to step up. Yeah, The Packers have been a surprise week one. Can they carry yeah. this forward going into week two? Yeah. But before we take off out of week one, we got to recap the other games. So let's do it, Pad. Yeah, so the game that opened the entire season was this past Thursday, uh, where it was uh, the Detroit Lions beating the Kansas City Chiefs 21 to 20. Acknowledge them. Yeah, hey, uh, Travis Kelsey, time to shave the mustache. Yes. Now, I don't care what fans are going to say. We have been saying here on the show, between Rich and myself, for quite some time, Detroit is better than people are giving them credit for. Mm hmm. They did not shy away from the spotlight. I understand Travis Kelsey wasn't there. And Chris Jones. And Chris Jones was not there either. But I don't put an asterisk by this game because you still have Patrick Mahomes. You hit. You have Patrick Mahomes, who at one point in the game hit Kadarius Tony in the goddamn numbers with nobody around him. Yeah. And it still turned into a pick six. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kadarius Tony. Mm-hmm. I mean, there... 
I'm sorry, like the you had, worst. You had the catch in the Super Bowl for the touchdown. Yeah, but kudos. The, but you know that was last year. Yeah. We're, what are we doing here now? Uh, Kadarius Tony, one catch, one yard, targeted five times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he played awful for him. Mm-hmm. Mahomes' receiver core was not up to snuff for this <laughs> one, to put it mildly. Uh, Valdez Scantling, two catches. Justin Watson, two catches. No, I'm never going to go for the yards. Uh, Noah Gray, three catches. Mm-hmm. Isaiah Pacheo, four catches. Rasheed Rice, three catches. Blake Bell, two. Jarek McKinnon, one. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, one. Rishi James, one. Justin Ross, one. And then also Sky Moore, none. Uh, he was targeted three times. Mm-hmm. But the biggest story that happened here for the offense, which nobody's talking about, mind you, who's Kansas City's leading rusher? Uh, that would be one Patrick Mahomes himself. Six carries, 45 yards. So when you had no offense on the ground, Detroit took advantage of the situation. Mm-hmm. And Detroit's defense showed up. Yeah, they did. Like I say, I think that they're flying under a lot of people's radars right now. Mm-hmm. But Hutchinson had a game for them as well. Anselone had one, too. Like I say, they came out with nothing to lose. No. Everybody was picking against them because they were six and a half dogs, and they showed up. Jared Goff in Detroit is a whole new player. Uh-huh. And is he playing smart? I, I did not realize he currently has the longest game streak of no interceptions right now. Really? I believe so. Interesting. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Obviously, if I'm wrong, hit me up. Hashtag ODPH wow. I believe he's in, like in the in the top three for most consecutive games, wow. I think, right now. I think, well, I also read he's now got like two wins against Patrick Mahomes. Mm-hmm. So we found the new uh, Tom Brady's Eli. Mm-hmm. And I will say this. Dan Campbell had some ice cold water in his veins. Because <laughs> late in that game, he took a gamble running it on fourth down. And earlier in the game, that was the tempo changer right there. Mm -hmm. But Detroit did what good teams do. They took advantage of bad mistakes. Yeah. And like I said, even if Travis Kelsey was there, I still think Detroit would have won. Yeah. Because I I think that they would have game plan for him. And then taking a look at the other receiver cores you you have. Yeah. I'm sorry. Tony set the the benchmark for your team in that one, in my opinion. And it's not fair to say, but let's face it. Who else stepped up to have a game? Yeah, no. Kelsey would have made a difference in that, like, uh, Detroit would have game plan for him, and Detroit's game plan would have been different, but I don't think it would have drastically changed the outcome of the game. No, I don't think so either. I don't think it would have, they would definitely have not won by seven. I'll put that out there right now. No. But we'll have to see as Kelsey we're waiting to hear on. Chris Jones, though, did resign for one year. For like $25 million. Yeah, it's insane. Holy fuck. Insane. Holy shit. But, hey, we'll have to see what happens. But Detroit, yeah. congratulations. And yeah. like we say, acknowledge them. Yeah. Uh, then you had the Atlanta Falcons defeat the Carolina Panthers by the final score of 24-10. to 10. Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta won. Atlanta's 1-0 uh, and o to start a season for the first time since I think it was like 2017, 2018. Something like that. It was, but then again, it was against the Panthers. Mm-hmm. But take nothing away. I mean, we'll give the credit where credit's due. Yeah. They had a really good game. Robinson really Ooh. showed up. Ooh. Very impressed with what I saw with him. 10 carries, 56 yards. Yeah. So there's a lot to take away from them moving forward that this was a good win against a bad team. Mm-hmm. Because let's face it, Bryce Young, decent quarterback in college, good quarterback in college. We'll see in the NFL, but like, like we said with – couple other teams are already he's got fucking nobody to play with yeah so we'll have to wait to see about this but you know hey atlanta you're one to know yeah enjoy it now uh and then you had the cleveland browns defeat the cincinnati Bengals 24 to 3 oh oh boy you know if it wasn't for the sunday night game i would have said this is probably the most embarrassing loss of the weekend mm-hmm. but cleveland i think they heard the episode last week where we said uh we wrote them off and they said uh Hold on a second. Yeah, really? Joe Burrow had one of the worst games in recent memory. 14 completions, 31 attempts, 82 yards, no touchdowns or interceptions. He averaged 2.6 yards per throw. He was sacked twice. He's got a QBR of 20.3 and a quarterback rating uh, a rating of 52.2. And for all the trash talk that Jamar Chase was doing. Called the Cleveland Browns uh, elves. Yeah. Cleveland showed up and punched them right in the mouth. Uh, Deshaun Watson, 16 to 29 for 154, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, Nick Chubb, 18 carries, 106 yards rushing, no touchdowns. And then Elijah Moore led in receiving three catches, 43 yards, and no touchdowns. Yeah, this was a huge win for Cleveland. Uh huh. Cincinnati, uh, they need a bounce back next week. Yes, they do. All you need to say about that, but an embarrassing loss. And Browns, kudos to you guys. Yeah. Very huge win. 
the Jacksonville Jaguars defeated the Indianapolis Colts by the final score of 31 to 21. Can I say gritty win? Yeah. Okay. Gritty win by the Jags. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trevor Lawrence looked great. Richardson looked good for the Colts, too. Like, a, this was a very evenly matched game, more than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it was only 14-7 at halftime. Indy came out the second half and put up 14 uh, to Jacksonville's three in the third quarter. But then it was that two. It was uh, Jacksonville shutting Indy out in that fourth quarter and ultimately made the difference. Uh, 14 points to a none from Indianapolis. Yeah, which, I mean, Richardson is still a rookie quarterback. We need to remember. Good stat line, But though. good stat line. 20 of thir- 24 of 37, 223, one touchdown, one interception. Doesn't help that he's the leading rusher, but then there's yep. the whole situation with Jonathan Taylor. I was just going to go there, so great minds think alike. Uh, that can be easily solved, much like the writer strike, just saying. Yeah. Oh, easily. Easily. There's a real easy solution to this, and that's, you know, Jim Ursay pulling his head out of his ass. Mm-hmm. Because he, I'm sorry, you need to pay Jonathan mm-hmm. Taylor when your when your rookie quarterback is your leading rusher by 36 yards, 10, yeah. 10 carries, 40 yards, one touchdown. Deion Jackson was the next closest guy, 13 carries, 14 yards, no touchdowns. Jake Funk, not any better, two carries, 10 yards, no touchdown. Evan Hull, who one carry, one yard, no touchdown. Yeah, that's not ideal. It's not ideal in comparison. Jacksonville looked great. And, yeah. you know, they showed up in the fourth quarter where they needed to. Kudos to Calvin Ridley. Uh, first game back, eight care, eight catches, 101, one touchdown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said. Great game for him. A lot of stuff on the offensive side to really take home with Jacksonville. So excited to see what they're going to wind up doing next. Uh, yeah, that's good. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, then you had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeat the Minnesota Vikings 20-17. to Bad loss for Minnesota. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very bad loss. Also, I saw the one highlight with Baker Mayfield when he was, like, running the ball. He got forced out of bounds, and then he, like, trash talks whatever the def- whoever the defender was. Um, you know, that t- tackled him out of bounds, and he basically told him to put on a few extra pounds. Yeah. I was like, where was this Baker the last couple of years? I love this. Baker is an interesting player. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right words to say, but... When he's motivated, mm-hmm. and he is right now because a lot of people wrote Tampa Bay off. A lot of people wrote him off. Yep. He's got he's playing with a chip on his shoulder, and that's when he plays very, very well. Much in the same vein as Kirk Cousins, mm-hmm. but if you look at that stat line, mm-hmm. Cousins 33 for 44, 344 and 2, mm-hmm. and they still lost the game. Mm-hmm. That's absurd. This is with Justin Jefferson putting up a buck fifty in yards by himself. Yeah, like this should not have been a loss by any stretch of the imagination. The man almost averaged two first downs a catch, sixteen point seven yards a catch. Yeah. So the fact that Baker Mayfield led the team in there. Holy shit! You had him, two, three, four, five guys on that offense receiving, and for Minnesota, average a first down a catch. Yeah. Holy shit. That's what I say. Like, when you keep diving into that stat line, like, your head's going to explode because you're like, how the hell did they lose this game? Yeah. And to Tampa Bay, who, I mean, Mike Evans had a good game, six catches, 66 yards, and a touchdown. Yeah. Godwin, five for 51. I mean, but honestly, they're great receivers. You and I could throw them the ball deep, and they'd fucking haul it in. Yeah. But you know what? Baker had a little swag to him. You know what? Can't can't fault him on that. So. Good win for them and horrible loss for Minnesota. Yeah. And it's not going to get better next week against Philly, just saying. No. Uh, then you had the uh, New Orleans Saints defeat the Tennessee Titans 16-15. to uh, You know, this game did not move the needle for me either way. No. Uh, it's a good win for uh, for New Orleans. For t- the Titans, um, I'd be a little skeptical. Decent stat line from Derrick Henry, 15 carries, 63 yards, no touchdowns. DeAndre, decent stat line for him, 7 for 65, no touchdowns. You know, but that's what I expect from DeAndre at this point. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not saying he's got to put up Randy Moss on Thanksgiving-type numbers, but, like, 7 for 65 is average for him. And and Henry, he had a good stiff arm. No, he had a great stiff arm. He had a great stiff arm, but, like, they got Tannehill there who is okay. That's the stat line I'd be worried about. Yeah, uh, 16 for 34, 198, no touchdowns, three interceptions. Yep. That's what I'd be worried about against a team that's defense is okay. Yeah. Good. Derek, not, Derek, not great. Derek Carr, good debut for New Orleans. You know, 23, 33, 305, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, hey, Michael Thomas actually showed up. Yeah. So uh, check the box off your play cards at home when he plays because it won't be much. 
you know, but you, you know, and Chris Olave had a good game for them, you know, eight for 112, one, no touchdowns. Mm-hmm. So like I say, a solid win for the saints, mm-hmm. uh, bad loss for the Titans. But then again, we set the bar low for uh, Tennessee, two teams that just, you don't know what the fuck you're going to get out of them each week. And well, Hey, let's face it. Somebody had to win. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then you had the San Francisco 49ers beat the ever loving, you know, what out of Pittsburgh by the Ooh. final score of 30 to seven. Brock Purdy's back. Everybody be scared. Oh, my God. He looked great in the return. The Niners looked amazing. Yeah, they did. Like, they looked like the best team in football. I'm looking like a genius for drafting Brandon Ayuk on a whim. Yeah. No, they look solid top to top to bottom. Uh, Brock Purdy, 19 and 29 for 220, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Christian McCaffrey led San Francisco in rushing because, duh. Yeah. 22 carries, 152 yards, one touchdown. And then Brandon Ayuk, uh, eight catches, 129 yards, and two touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, it was video game numbers, so to speak. Yeah. They, they look great. Uh, Kenny Pickett did not look the best. Best, but then again, you're against the the best team in the league. Yeah, one of the best uh, defenses in all of the NFL. Yeah, and he's, I mean, we got to remember, still very young in his career. Uh, Sacked five times. Yeah, that's not helping anything either way. But you know what? Huge win for the 49ers. Yeah, big for the 49ers. Uh, Then you had the, talk about those, uh, you had the Raiders beat the Broncos, which we already mentioned. Uh, And then we got to get to, uh, we'll we'll, we'll skip that next one because we'll leave Oh, no, no, no. We got to talk about that one. Well, no, I'm going to leave it till the end when we talk about yours and my team. Oh, fair enough. Uh, Then we have your favorite, your other favorite team, the Miami Dolphins defeating the Los Angeles Chargers 36 to 34. This was a video game on easy. Yeah, it was. This was ridiculous. If you and if anybody is tuning in for the first time now, uh, first and foremost, thank you for checking out, checking us out. I have said on record mm-hmm. numerous times mm-hmm. the Los Angeles Chargers are the most inconsistent team in all of pro sports. Facts. You ch- are trying to tell me at home, and you're winning. You wind up losing this game. By the score of 34 to 36. Mm -hmm. And your team, which is full of great offensive players. Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, Mike Mike, uh, Williams. Cannot cannot match up to Tyreek Hill, 11 catches, 215 and 2. I'm going to be honest, and Chargers fans, this might hurt. Uh, I saw the photos of the AI robots for the, that upcoming yeah gareth, that's... that upcoming gareth edwards movie that was a whole promotional thing for the gareth edwards movie that's coming out saw the photos of those robots in the front row at sofi stadium chargers fans those robots could have covered tyree kill better than your secondary did yeah 11 catches 215 yards two touchdowns the man averaged 19.5 yards a catch they the... and also had one of the nastiest catches i saw on sunday oh yeah agreed agreed no, that defense in Los Angeles is good. It's borderline great, mm-hmm. but they don't show up. Nope. And I'm sorry. You know if Tua is there, there's literally one or two people he's going to throw to. Waddle or uh, Tyreek. And chances are more times than not he's going to throw a Tyreek Hill. Because his uh, security blanket tight end ain't there no more. Exactly. He's up north. Yeah. So who else he's going to throw to? Uh, let's run through the list. Uh, uh, Durham Smith. Who? Braxton Berrios. Who? River Ca- uh, C- Crockraft. Who? Alec Ingold. I think I know who he is. Uh, Raheem Mostert. I know who he is. Salvin Ahmed. Ahmed. Who? Uh, and then in the receive the rushing core, because, hey, you can throw to running backs, too. Uh, Eric uh, Zukanma. No idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like I say, the the... The talent pool here in this game was very, very slim. Game planning Miami ain't hard. Don't expect the rush. No. Like, literally, focus on Tyreek Hill. Make Waddle beat you. Which Waddle, can, I mean, he can. Mm-hmm. But let's face it. You know it's going to go to Tyreek Hill that you should have had him double teamed, if not triple teamed all game. Mm-hmm. Literally. And, yeah. and, and challenge Waddle to do something. Mm-hmm. Because you know what? His stat line is not bad four and 78. No. But the fact that Tyreek Hill burnt you that much, mm-hmm. 215 and 2. It was targeted 15 times. He caught 11 of them. Exactly. Like, hello? Yeah. I don't know how else to put it. And the Chargers, the fact that you put up 34 and couldn't close is insulting. It's a joke. If you take it, so when you look at Tua's stat line, 28 of 45, you're like, oh, that's not great. But that's from everybody not named Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle not really catching the ball. Mm-hmm. You take everybody out except for Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. They dropped 
five balls. Yeah. All day. Four from Tyree Kill, one from Jalen Waddle. Everybody else, it was Durham Smith. He dropped four or didn't catch four, I guess you, you should say. Uh, Braxton Berrios, he missed two. River uh, Crockraft, he missed two. Uh, Alec Ingold, he missed one. Uh, he didn't miss. He didn't miss any. Neither did Rip Monster. And then Selvin Ahmed, he missed three. Yeah. You know, so uh, listen, it, it, the game plan for Miami is easy. Target Hill and Waddle and you're good. Exactly. Make Monster beat you. Sorry, just putting it out there. And the fact you had the lead late and you uh-huh. let it slip. Uh-huh. That's the biggest thing. The Chargers charged. I yep. hate I hate saying this. I do like the Chargers, but man, you find ways to lose when the game is in your hands. Mm-hmm. And this was prime example of it. Mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Uh, then you had the L.A. Rams beat the Seattle Seahawks by the final score of 30-13. to 13. Shocked at this one. Uh, I'm about as shocked at this one as Geno Smith was with Aaron Donald coming at him. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I agree. Like Same, Geno. Same. Yeah. I And I, you know what? I don't blame him for being scared. Mm-mm. But the Rams surprised, especially Seattle at home, which was up at, at halftime. Yeah. The fact you gave up 23 unanswered, oh. especially with that defense, which is much improved. Supposed to be rebuilding the Legion of Boom. Yeah. I, I think somebody took the day off on Le- construction Legion, day Legion there. Legion of Boom 2.0. Uh, me thinks you're only a version like 1.3 right now. Yeah. No, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, not hitting the panic button just yet, but – that was a statement win by the Rams. Mm-mm. And, you know, kudos to Matthew Stafford. I always root for him because, yeah. you know, he is somebody that literally, every time he steps on the field, he literally leaves it on the field. Yeah. Every time. And like I say, last year, I thought they did him a disservice by keeping him out there as hurt as he was. Yeah. And to see him bounce back, it's a great win for them. And especially doing this without Cooper Cup. Yeah. And that wide receiver core. They stepped up, though. Holy fuck. Yeah. Tutu Atwell, 6 for 119, no touchdowns. Puka uh, Nakua, 10 for 119, no touchdowns. Goddamn. Yeah, like I say, to have that kind of turnout from your wide receiver core, especially when your star is missing, Uh huge. Huge. Yeah, Uh, and concerning for me, for Seattle on the offensive side, uh, DK Metcalf's temper. Yeah. Ooh, not a good look. Not a good look. So Seattle has some work to do. Yes, they do. And then we got to talk about the Sunday night game because good God damn. Woo! Good God damn. Expected a uh, barn burner on this one, although not exactly in the way it went. I expected it to be a little bit of a closer affair. Uh, but you had the Dallas Cowboys taking on the New York football Giants, and the Dallas Cowboys put the uh, whooping on the New York football Giants, uh, opening up a can of whoop ass. Yes, Coach Duffy, they did actually play on Sunday. No, there wasn't a Giants by in week <laughs> one. Uh, but yeah, the Dallas Cowboys won by the final score of 40 to nothing. So is the Brian Dabble, Daniel Jones hangover officially gone now? Uh, it should have been gone a long time ago because as we've said from the year Daniel Jones got drafted, he is not that guy. Yeah. This is a bad loss. And this is this is without a stellar stat line from Dak Prescott. Mm-hmm. 13 to 24, 143, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Now, if you read me just that stat line and didn't tell me, you know, who the player was or what team they played for, you're just like, "Hey, there was a quarterback on Sunday who 3 for 13 for 24, 143, no touchdowns or interceptions. How do you think they did?" Probably 75, 80% of the time I'm going to sit there and go, "Oh, they probably lost." Yeah. No, he won. Yeah, this just goes to show how good Dallas's defense is. Uh huh. And if it's not for San Francisco, they probably have the best defense in the league. That defense was scary, at least for that game. Yeah, there is something to be very, very feared of this defense as it stands right now. They looked phenomenal. Seven sacks as a team combined. Uh huh. Three turnovers. There was a uh, one, uh, three. Uh, was that? No, that. Yeah, that's the Giants. Uh, they had three turnovers. Yeah. Uh, one fumble and then uh, two interceptions. No, they look good. I mean, Micah Parsons leading that squad. There is a lot, if you're a Dallas fan, to be excited about. Yeah. So if they can keep this momentum up, Mm -hmm. they'll be good and really make a deep run in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's a long ways to go since we just started. Yeah. But if I'm the Giants, on the other hand, there's a lot I would be panicking about. Yeah. And I think that now week two against Arizona. Mm Mm-hmm. Is now the most must win game two in recent memory? Yeah. Because let's say this if they lose, and I'll even give this stat line if they lose 14 to 13, Mm -hmm. this team is in trouble. Oh, yeah, they are. Big time. That is how 
you're now going to get benchmarked. Because as we're going to talk about here in a little bit, the sole focus of the New York media is now on the Giants. Mm -hmm. You might have been able to fly under the radar had the events of Monday night not occurred. Oh, yeah. The events of Monday night did occur, though. That's not some fever dream. Sorry, Jets fans, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. So now the Jets are an afterthought. Well, and, and I'm early preview, but the Jets are an afterthought at this point. Yeah. So as has been the case for the last 40-some-odd years, 50-some-odd years, whatever the math works out to be, the, the sole focus of the New York media is now on the Giants. Because, hey, the Jets are going to be the Jets unless they pull off a miraculous run and win the Super Bowl. Nobody's really expecting much out of them. Mm. They're, they're expecting some stuff out of the Giants because you guys have been here a while. Yeah. So, good luck. Yeah, it's going to be a tough road for the Giants. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is going to be a very, very long season in a short time. Yeah. So let us get to our games before we wrap things up. So, Pad, yeah. yours was earlier. Let's yeah. talk about yeah. it. Yeah, so uh, my New England Patriots lost to the Philadelphia Eagles 25-20. And I got to say, you know, not happy with the loss, but it's not a bad loss. Agreed. You know, the first, you know, two scores they gave up in the first half, you know, you can kind of chalk up to the weather because if you didn't see the game, it was fucking pouring buckets. You know, so ball a little slippery. I understand that. But they came back and they and they did well. And for as vaunted as that Philadelphia team is, mm -hmm. the Patriots didn't give up a sack on Mac until like the fourth quarter or, or something absurd like that. You know, and this is with them without playing without Devontae Parker, one of their one of their number one receivers. They were down two starting O linemen, mm -hmm. you know, but the fact that they only lost to the defending NFC champs by five points, they held Jalen Hurts to 170 yards passing. Uh, AJ Brown had 79 yards catching and dev catching, and then Devontae Smith had only 47. Not a bad loss, I would say. You know, it it it. I think it shows. You know, what happened with Mac last year is in the past. Mm -hmm. He's building, and he's back to rookie year Mac, you know, and he's going to improve as the weeks go on. You know, if you get you know, once you get Devontae Parker back and you get the other two starting alignment back, you know, but I, I think things are trending in the right direction, and it sucks, but I, I was happy with it. I don't blame you for being happy because, you know what, I would have been happy too in the circumstance. Mm -hmm. Tom Brady was in attendance. Yeah. Going to have his jersey retired. Uh, this just in water is wet, too. Yeah, really. So there's a lot of emotion at Foxborough. Yeah. But the one thing that I will applaud the Patriots for, they're down 16 nothing at the end of the first quarter. Mm -hmm. This is looking like they're going to be the Giants 2.0. Mm -hmm. They held on, and they bounced back. 14 unanswered in the second quarter. They showed a lot of composure. Belichick is the king of making second-half adjustments. They did. Mm -hmm. They really slowed Philly down. Mm -hmm. And there was a chance that Mac was going to pull off an upset. Yeah. It really was. And this goes to show how good Philly is, mm -hmm. but it also shows how good the Patriots could be yeah. if they show up like this. That defense was nasty. They really stepped up to the challenge. Now, are they going to do it consistently? Time will tell. Well, yeah, we'll see. Right. But I agree with you. I think if you're a Patriots fan, there's a lot to enjoy about this yeah. loss. Yeah. That at least your team really looked like they are con are a contender. Yeah, I mean, looking at the team from last year to this year, where last year, you know, they were ready to punt it on third down in a lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of instances, oh, yeah. to, hey, we're going for it on fourth down. You know, which, you know, you can argue all day until you're blue in the face, was it the right decision or not. But as a Patriots fan, having watched them basically be ready to punt on third down last year, I'm happy they're at least trying. And oh, they're going for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's a lot of takeaways that you can have that you can be really excited about this. Team. Yeah. So kudos to you for that. Yeah. Also, uh, I think it was Kayshawn Boot. Uh, remember, like, Kyle, it's not college. you got to get both feet in bounds. Yeah. That's yep. all I'm going to say. Yep. And then uh, you might want to put the disclaimer on for this one. Uh, f uh, folks, what you're about to listen is the opinion of that of Ken M and does not re uh, necessarily reflect that of the ODPH. Listener discretion is advised. So Monday night. <laughs> oh, boy. The Buffalo Bills went to MetLife Stadium to take on Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. And this game was already nuts before it even started mm -hmm. because there was a shelter-in-place warning put out from storms in the area. Yeah, there was a lot of really weird things happening this, with this, this game. Ga this game got crazy early. Aaron Rodgers, the longtime quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, making his debut with the New York Jets after a very messy divorce from Green Bay. Yeah. Let's not lie about it. Yeah. Came out... And was unfortunately injured mm -hmm. in the beginning of the first quarter. 
And he immediately knew it was. Uh, what was it, like four plays into his uh, season? Yeah. So right then and there, the air let out of the stadium. Mm-hmm. And it was def- – and you could, I mean, you could definitely tell there was a shift in the mood. Yes. Buffalo goes on to score three points, and then they jump out to a little bit of a lead – going into the second half. Uh, at halftime, it was 13-3 to three in favor of Buffalo. Mm-hmm. And then the Bills did something that I am accustomed to. As somebody that has watched them, and Pad, you can even agree to this as much. Mm-hmm. What do they not do in the second half? Make adjustments. Correct. If, if their offensive coordinator, whoever that may be, and even sh- oh, offensive even, is Kent Dorsey. Uh, and then even you can make this, you know, uh, claim with the head coach there, Sean McDermott, because mm-hmm. hey, this isn't a new thing. This has been going on for like his entire tenure there. His kryptonite is their kryptonite is second half adjustments. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that they did not adjust right from the get go is your run defense needed to be switched up mm-hmm. because Brees Hall ten carries, one hundred and twenty seven yards. And one of which was 85 yards. 83, but yeah. Close enough. That you could not stop him. You stopped Dalvin Cook. which Uh, 13 carries, 33 yards. I will say, he played bad. Yeah. Not going to lie about it. Although, shout out Eli Manning for throwing Brees Hall under the bus on Manning cast. Yeah. (laughs) That was was rough. Yikes. That that was real rough. If you haven't seen the clip, look it up. Mm -hmm. So, with this being said... You put everything on cruise control. Mm-hmm. The minute that you saw Zach Wilson reemerge. Mm-hmm. And I will say this. Zach Wilson played good. Mm-hmm. Better than he has in recent memory. Mm-hmm. Not great. But your defense put it on cruise control, and so did your offense. The, the minute that Rodgers went down, you guys literally just said, <laughs> we got this in the bag. We're not worried. There was never a sense of urgency to close this game out, especially going into the fourth quarter. And this is something I'm going to make the statement here, and it is what it is. Josh Allen is the modern-day version of Brett Favre. Mm. And what he, what I mean by this is when he's on the field, he gunslings. Yeah. yeah. And he pays little regard to, to certain elements of the game, meaning if it's third and five, we don't need to throw it 60 yards downfield into triple coverage. Yeah, I noticed the. I forget who it was. Somebody brought this up on first take today that, like, the decision-making he's had the last couple of years hasn't gotten better as you would expect. It's regressed. That, like, he's making throws that he has no business making. Can't well, Like, can he make those throws? Sure. But when it comes to the coverage and the receivers and where the defenders are, like... He shouldn't be like, like he's just like chucking it up and praying that somebody's there. Well, what he's relying on too much, and and I guess this is the the other side of a coin. Mm-hmm. Everybody complains that he runs too much. I complain that when he runs and doesn't slide or go out of bounds, yeah, yeah. I can I complain all the time. It's still an issue for him, but it's still an issue, and especially when he's trying to shoulder people too. That's a whole different subject. I'm gonna yeah. remain composure. When you see him in third and five and they have the lead, and he heaves it 60 yards downfield to, I think it was Gabe Davis? I think so, yeah. And it's triple covered. That is a problem. And he was doing this multiple times, and then he was also locked and loaded on Stefan Diggs, which, listen, if I had Stefan Diggs as my wide receiver too, I probably would be, but in comparison, Diggs was targeted 13 times. Uh James Cook was targeted... Six times. He's the next one that was that high. That's your running back. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. So I don't know if it was the drama in the offseason, because there was some. Let's not lie about it. No. There was a little something there. Call a spade a spade. It is. Call it right down the middle, like a 607 TWS. Josh is trying to do too much things like Favre. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is going to cost him, because... Favre got lucky more times than not, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Josh is not that lucky. Josh has an arm, a very good one. But if you think that eventually that is not going to slow down enough that you're going to get picked off, that's a problem. 
And that was a very, very big problem in this game. Mm-hmm. Because especially when Jordan Whitehead has three interceptions on you, he's reading what you're doing the entire game. Because why? You keep trying to force it to Stefan Diggs. You're not giving what the defense is letting you have. Jordan Whitehead was the number one receiver for the Buffalo Bills. Exactly. I mean, let's face it. It was such a good game for Jordan Whitehead that he hit one of his contract incentives in the first goddamn week. Yeah. He had an incentive in his contract that if he got three interceptions this season, he'd earn himself a $250,000 bonus. Mm -hmm. He earned a quarter of a million dollars in one game. Kudos to you. Which, hey, shout out to him. That's that's real hard to do. I'm not mad about that one bit. I am mad that we actually started developing a run game and we went away from it because of Mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah. James Cook, 12 carries, 46 yards. Great. One week, no 100-yard rusher. Right. Because we went away from it. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially because we had the lead. Right. See, that is the problem. I understand that you want to make this big splash, and for some reason, we're now comparing ourselves to Kansas City. Because I don't know the whole Patrick Mahomes, yeah. you know, highlight reel. I don't. I don't know. Like I don't. It, it's the modern day Brady, Brett Favre. Yeah, or not Brett Favre, uh, Peyton Manning. You right. know, I I experience this a lot with the comparisons between, you know, Brady and Peyton. You know, when when that whole rivalry was going on, that mm-hmm. like was it warranted? Yeah, to a certain degree, but it didn't need to be for everything. This this is the new modern Brady and Brett Favre, or not? God, I keep saying Brett Favre, Peyton Manning. Well, no, because let's face it, he is Brett Favre. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it. That's exactly how he plays. And listen, as a Bills fan, I love seeing it, but I hate seeing it. It's fun to do in the video game, but you don't need to do it every down. Well, especially if you are losing the grip of the game. Why are you sitting there and trying to put up a highlight reel? You don't need to do it. You just need to win. That's it. Mm -hmm. And when you have the lead late, why are you trying to take risks? Yeah. See, that is the thing that separates the Bills from taking that next step and closing out and going to a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And this is solely on Josh. Now, granted, I love Josh. I think he's great. But at the same time, this has to be McDermott or Dorsey or somebody pulling him aside and say, listen, you don't need to pad the stats. Right. Well, because this is clearly uh, an issue with him. Because since he was drafted in 2018, he is number one in the NFL in turnovers with 84, interceptions with 63, 54 fumbles. He lost 21 of them. So Mm -hmm. he fumbled it 54 times, 21 times they weren't recovered. And then he has 22 career games with a uh, turnover. Yeah. All of those categories, he is number one in the league since 2018. Because he takes too many risks. And, like, listen, I understand you're trying to extend the play. I get it. I'm not. Yeah. But there comes a time where you have to. to Throw it away. To be. Yeah. Like, listen, slide. That was one of the most. Throw it out of bounds. That was one of the most fucking obnoxious things about playing Peyton, arguably twice every year, once in the regular season, once in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. That he was a surgeon on the fucking field. That he could sit there. He could figure out what the defense is going to do before he hiked the ball. He knew where to throw it. And when he was looking for an open receiver, if he didn't have anything, he'd throw it away. Well, that's the, yeah. And, and that, that, that's been the biggest thing. Josh, just for whatever reason, cannot figure out. I'll be honest. I was not watching this game to start out. Nothing against the Bills or the Jets, but I'm not a fan. No, let's be honest. I was watching Monday Night Raw. And then the whole thing with Aaron Rodgers happened, and I turned it over for that and watched to see what happened with that. And then they took him into the X-ray room. I'm like, all right, well, that's going to be the you end. Know, he ain't coming back from that if they're carting him off the field and they're putting him in the X-ray mm-hmm. room. So I went back to watching Monday Night Raw. And then the game developed the way they wake. And also, I'm looking at this going, all right, it's Zach Wilson. Like, you, the Jets clearly did not have enough faith in this guy that, he, you know, they wanted him to be the starter entering this year that you went out and, and spent the farm on bringing Aaron Rodgers and his entire plethora of former teammates into the building, mm-hmm. including adding Delvin Cook. I went, yeah, there's no shot for, for the Jets to win this. This is all Buffalo. And then Monday Night Raw gets over, and I look at the score, and I'm like, holy shit, how is this still a game? No, oh, yeah, because you know what? The Bills took the foot off the gas. That's literally what happened. And you know what? They let him come back in. They're lucky they got a tie. Mm-hmm. Tyler Bass kicking the 50-yard field goal and having a doink everywhere. Yeah. Scariest sound I heard. I actually, Pat can attest to this, I don't watch when he kicks. No, he does not. Uh, PATs, field goals, he looks the other goddamn way. Yep, I started working on a review for Nerd Initiative. Dropping tomorrow and as you hear this, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern yeah. Standard Time. Uh, so, like I say, 
the fact that we got a gift and then we got the ball on the kickoff in overtime because at this stage it's 16 to 16. The Bills go three and out and they kick and they give up a 65 yard kick return mm-hmm. to Xavier Gibson. Mm-hmm. Game over. Yep. And I know people talk about the trip, but yeah, ticky tacky. Yeah, could it have been? Yeah, maybe. You know what? Holding happens on every game. Yeah. Every every down. That's like why teams wear the same color uh, gloves as their opponents' uniforms. Mm-hmm. I mean, listen, it is what it is. Sure, could they have called it? Yeah, but you know what? They still were in field goal range. I mean, it's wild to me that Zach Wilson had a better uh, rating of what is it? Eighty. I'm looking at here. Eighty one point four. He had a better rating than uh, Lamar Jackson. Justin Fields, Patrick Mahomes, Dak Prescott, Kenny Pickett, Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, and Daniel Jones. Yeah, it's and cr- also Ryan Tannehill. It's crazy to think about. Uh huh. It, 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 le- it legit is. But you know what? He did what he needed to do. Yeah. He was serviceable. Yeah. He moved the chains. Garrett Wilson helped him out a lot. Holy the shit! Catch, catch of the year. Uh, that might be better than OBJ's. I'll say it right now. No, I agree with you. Definitely was. Couldn't believe that. But you know what? It's that kind of momentum stuff that the Jets needed. Yeah. And they got. Oh, they're going to need. And they're going to need it moving forward because Aaron Rodgers out the year. Out the year officially. It, it is a fully torn uh, Achilles. Not partially. Not minorly. No, nah, it's fully torn. And I think, unfortunately, this is the end for him. I, You know, man, I don't know. Um, I can see a guy like him trying to make a comeback because he wouldn't want to go out like that. And, and I'm not saying this like I know Aaron Rodgers, but just having watched him played for basically his entire career, you know, he, he just doesn't strike me as the type that like, that's how he wants to go out. I can see him trying to make a comeback and I, and I fully expect him to see the same doctor that Kobe Bryant did, you know, mm. rest his soul when Kobe tore his Achilles and when the same doctor Kevin Durant saw when he tore his, but when, when Kobe did it and Kevin Durant did it, they weren't 39 years old. You know, it, it it's a, it's a young man's sport, and and recovering from injuries, the older you get, doesn't get any easier. It takes longer, you know. So we'll see what happens. You know, I I'm just gonna say I can't see him wanting to go out like this. I think he's gonna try, but I think he's gonna hit a point where. He's, he might realize, all right, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. It might be time for me to retire. I say, honestly, it's 50-50. Oh, let, I agree. Because let's face it. Remember, he went in the darkness for four days. Yeah. He came out and decided he wanted to play football, and he was, yeah. and he was, dis, he was contemplating retirement. Yeah. Then. So, like I say, he, Aaron's a different dude. Right, and, and the other thing, too, is he doesn't have necessarily the pull a lot of other players do at this point in their career, which, oh, I wish I was around my wife more. Wish I was around for my kids more. I mean, you know, the missed birthdays and the missed recitals and the missed sporting events. Like, he's not married. He doesn't have any kids. So, you know, the only love he has is the love of football. And from all the stories I've heard today, you know, from – Pat McAfee and the AJ Hawks and whatever of just like how much time and effort he put into this off season mm-hmm. of wanting to come in there. Like he's in the best shape he's been in, in a number of years and he's got the same energy level he did in his mid twenties. And he invested in a new body, a body coach, you know, to where help get his body in shape and all this other stuff that like, I just can't picture him putting all this time, effort, and getting this. Because he could have easily just come in there and been like, yeah, I'm Aaron Rodgers. I'm a four-time MVP. Cater to me. I'm just going to coast. Yeah. But he's been involved. He's been talking. He's been coaching. He, You know, he was on the on the mic when Zach Wilson was taking the, the, the quarterback duties in the preseason. You know, I just can't. With everything he's put into this, I can't see him calling it quits after this. But if he does, it wouldn't surprise me. Like I say, it's legit fifty fifty. I don't think he does. I think he he's like, I got other investments. I want to do some other yeah, things. Yeah, I could fully see him. But you know what? If he comes back, great. I just hope he's healthy. It's just not going to be easy because it's it's a ten to twelve month recovery, and that's if everything goes right. Exactly. And at forty years old. It's tough. Uh huh. So we'll have to wait and see about this. But yeah. for you know the Bills, a lot of work to do against those Raiders. Mm-hmm. That's that's going to be a really interesting game. And for the Jets, well, you have a defense. Yeah, they played great. Your offensive line is not. And can Zach Wilson capture the magic? I don't know. Maybe they should put a call into Tom Brady. Can we stop this shit? Because <laughs> I was kidding. Well, no, I know, but like people are actually legitimately posing this question. Really? He, yes. He's part owner of the Raiders. I don't know. Like, I'm now, admittedly, I'm not. Right, right, right. I'm not versed in the NFL rules yeah, and yeah. regulations front to back. I don't think he can do it as the owner of another team. So, like, 
okay, are there other guys? Plus the other thing of it is too, not even with Brady, but bring somebody else in, you know, because Carson Wentz name got thrown around Nick Foles. I know Colin Kaepernick has expressed his interest or he's, he's, his agent has told the Jets, you know, he's willing to come in. Hell, I know Robert Griffin, the third on ESPN this morning was making a pitch for him to play for the Jets, Mm -hmm. you know, but like, that's the other thing too, is like, it's going to be tough if they bring anybody in there because they're going to have to learn this shit on the fly. Yeah. Zach Wilson at least knows it because he's been there the whole off season and at least, and, and now admittedly, did he have the greatest stat line on Monday night? No, but that's because the game plan and what was set up was designed for Aaron Rodgers. Mm. Zach Wilson and Aaron Rodgers' skill sets are not even nearly the same. Exactly. A lot of headlines moving forward into week two of the NFL, but hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your takeaways from week one? How did your team do, ODPH Society? Hit us up. Let us know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do you like comic books? What about movies and TV shows? Well, we may be the show for you. We're Hops Geek News, a weekly podcast that discusses comics, movies, and TV shows while featuring a beer of the week. Every week, we chat about what we messed up on the week before, and then we dive into what we're reading and watching, as well as some news. We then wrap it up with a geek-themed topic of the week. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts by searching Hops Geek News. Cheers. Cheers. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and we have to talk some wrestling and UFC. Yeah, we do. Combined. Mm -hmm. Now, what exactly are we going to be talking about, Pat? Uh, We are going to be talking about the merger, which has been reported and talked about for, it seems like, forever at this point. Uh, But it is finally official. uh, The merger between the the UFC and WWE all becoming under one umbrella uh, with the Endeavor Group uh, and being on the stock market now under the uh, acronym TKO. So big news happening. We've been speculating about this for quite some time, that the ownership group of the UFC had finally purchased the WWE. Mm -hmm. The Vince McMahon era is now officially over. Uh, For the first time in over 40 years, I believe it is. Yeah. The WWE is not in control and being run and owned by a McMahon. Yeah. So this is a truly game-changing move. Yeah. And the fallout is going to be one that we definitely are going to be keeping our eyes on for because mm-hmm. there's a lot of who's in charge, who is not, mm-hmm. what is happening here. I know you got the breakdown of who's doing what. Yeah, so I got an article here from ESPN.com written by Mark uh, Ramondi, and the article reads, quote, The UFC and WWE are now officially under one roof. Endeavor, the UFC's parent company, and WWE announced Tuesday the closing of its merger and the launch of TKO a company that will combine the forces of the two global powerhouse live event and sports promoters. TKO began trading on the New York Stock Exchange on Tuesday morning. Endeavor will now own 51% of the new company, and WWE shareholders will own 49% of it. TKO has a valuation of $21.4 billion and will serve, quote, more than 1 billion young and diverse fans reaching viewers in 180 countries and producing more than 350 annual live events, close quote, according to a release. TKO will use Endeavor's expertise in domestic and international media rights, ticket sales, and yield optimization, event operations, global partnership, licensing, and premium hospitality to drive revenue growth. Former WWE controlling shareholder and chairman Vince McMahon will act as executive chairman of TKO with Nick Khan, who also sits on the board as WWE president. Dana White, the former UFC president, will now have the title of UFC CEO. Endeavor's Ari Emanuel will be the CEO of TKO and Endeavor's Mark Shapiro is the president and chief of operating officer of the new company. Quote, Where we want to get is where every UFC fan is a WWE fan, and every WWE fan is a UFC fan. Uh, UFC Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Lawrence Epstein told ESPN. The merger was first announced in April. WWE had been seeking a merger, and Khan told ESPN he believes McMahon really started thinking about Endeavor as a partner when McMahon, Khan, uh, McMahon's daughter Stephanie and WWE Chief Content Officer Paul Triple H Levesque attended UFC 276 in July 2022 in Las Vegas. Uh, Khan said McMahon saw similarities between the UFC and WWE and how they grew. 
Uh, McMahon and White were instrumental in building their respective enterprises from the ground up and are thought of as two of the most influential combat sports promoters ever. Khan, who, while with CAA, helped WWE negotiate its last media rights deal before Mc, uh, becoming McMahon's top executive in 2020, said there are similar characteristics in the DNA of both companies. Close quote. So, a lot to take away from this. Mm -hmm. So, as we stated, Vince McMahon is not in charge of WWE anymore. Nope, he oversees the whole shooting match. Right. Except he's got a boss to now answer to. Exactly. So, for everybody that's been panicking about, like, he's still in charge and that whole drama, Mm -hmm. he's not. He is going to be having his hands tied up with Endeavor. Yeah. In TKO. Like, he's not part of this. Is he going to offer ideas? I'm sure. But you know what? If Triple H, who is still in charge of creative, and yep. Nick Khan, who is still president, mm-hmm. want to go pick his brain for thoughts about an idea they want to do, mm-hmm. I'm sure he's going to entertain it. Right, and he's not ever going to let it go that like and completely forget about it. Mm-hmm. It's his baby. It's his. It's his child. He's dealt with and, and adopted and inherited, whatever you want to say. You know, since the '80s. You mm-hmm. know, so uh, is he going to suggest things from time to time? Sure. But his plate just got a whole lot busier being in charge or being, you know, the what what's what's his official title? Um, chairman. Being the chairman of a twenty one point four billion dollar company. Yeah, that's a lot more. That's worth a lot more than WWE was. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of moving parts to go with that. Exactly. So I think that first, that's going to be the biggest impact mm-hmm. that fans are going to notice. Yeah. As much as certain ones don't want to believe in, like folks, this is this is facts. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I don't know how else to spell it to you. Yeah. But I think the big takeaway, and there's a quote in here that I want to read again. Sure. And this came from UFC uh, Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Lauren Epstein. Or Lawrence. Lawrence. Lawrence said that. Apologies. And the quote is, where we want to get is where every UFC fan is a WWE fan and every WWE fan is a UFC fan, end quote. Mm-hmm. I think that's a bold strategy. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to go, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. I think there are very much similarities between both, but it's a different product. Mm -hmm. And to get, if they get half to get on board, sure, I think is a win. See, I think where it could help UFC is if they adopt kind of the the strategy, I guess you could say, WWE's got, where Mm -hmm. they've got their, now obviously it's apples and oranges, but hey, it's still all produce. Still all produce. You look at the WWE and their and their primary television is on their primary pro, you know product is on television. Mm-hmm. You got Monday Monday Night Raw on the USA Network for right now. Obviously, the rights are up at the end of October twenty twenty four, but for right now, they're still with USA Network. You've got uh, Friday Night SmackDown, which is on Fox, and then you've got NXT, which is on USA Network, and then you've got the Level Up, and you've got some of the main event and all the other stuff, but still. Fairly easy to consume, I would say, you yeah. know, because even if you don't have regular cable, if you've got Hulu, you know, it's available in a condensed version on Hulu the next day for uh, for Raw, SmackDown and NXT. And then if you don't even have that, it's available on Peacock. I believe it's like a month, a little over a month after it airs, just because of the way the rights work with the Hulu and WWE. Mm. You know, and then they've got their pay-per-view, which, as we've said before, and I know you guys have said on 607 TWS, the WWE pay-per-views are accessible for like five bucks a month, Mm. which is a stupid, crazy deal. Now you get ads, but it's not like an ad in the middle of the match. It's like, no, when they're showing you the promo package or the recap for the next upcoming match, they're running an ad for, you know, Jacqueline's Beef Jerky or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So super, cons- super easy to consume, super easy to get into, super easy to keep track of, you know, and, and brings in a lot of folks to watch because of, you, you know, you, you we hear all the time after all the pay-per-views of all oh, there was the most watched, you know, backlash in, in company history. It was the most watched, you know, SummerSlam in company history. It was the most watched, it was the most watched that because it's so easy to consume. What I think that where I think this can help UFC is follow a similar track. Now, obviously, they've already got you know the ESPN Plus mm-hmm. and the ESPN deal. ESPN Plus deal is going to be a lot easier for UFC with the whole charter uh, spectrum uh, deal that just went through. Because with the spectrum deal that just went through, starting in I forget when it is, but uh, a certain level of spectrum TV owners are going to get ESPN Plus for free. Right. So. You need, now you're going to have a lot more people watching that way if they start offering ESPN Plus to more 
uh, cable providers on a, if you're at a certain level. What that level is, I couldn't tell you. I just know it's available at a certain level. The other thing I think that would help UFC is what has been our biggest complaint with the UFC pay-per-view system? The pricing. It's expensive as fuck. Yeah. Back in the day, what was the WWE pay-per-view price? Like 35 for uh, non-premium events like WrestleMania is 50. Okay, so whatever the math ends up being now with, with inflation and everything else, but still, not that crazy. Nowadays for UFC, it's like 80 bucks, 90 bucks. Whatever. It's somewhere around there. It's expensive as fuck. And so it's hard to get into when if you're an AEW fan or you're a fan of something else or just let's face it, money's tight these days because, you know, stuff's going up in price and whatever else it is. So what I think can help the UFC and get more fans on to UFC is if they get a deal similar to what WWE has with Peacock. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not saying they're going to go to Peacock and they're going to be able to, but whatever it ends up being, because I, I don't know when the UFC deal with ESPN and uh, that whole thing runs through. But, you know, if they can get a similar de- if they can follow the WWE, because one of the smartest things WWE ever did was the network. Mm-hmm. You know, 10 bucks a month, you got every pay-per-view ever, every Monday Night Raw, except for the ones, you know, the month prior. You know, and then you got, and then it was all the territories they had the libraries for ECW, WCW, and, you know, everything else they've added, plus the original programming. And then it moved over to here stateside, Peacock, if, if you're overseas, it's still on the WWE network. Mm-hmm. You know, I, so, and I realize UFC has got Fight Pass, but that's a whole other ticket price. That's a whole other thing. And, and even if you have Fight Pass, you can't watch the, the pay per views, which mm-hmm. makes no sense to me, but hey, I'm not in charge of the business side. So where I think this can, like I said, where I think this can help UFC is if they follow a similar path to, like WWE and get it so that, hey, our our pay-per-views are available on this streaming service for whatever the price ends up being. Now, whether that'll be in like an Amazon Prime, a Netflix, you know, Hulu, ESPN Plus again, but it's a reworked deal. I don't know, but I think that can certainly help UFC. I think so, too. I think that the UFC is going to benefit from this more than WWE. Mm-hmm. I think the UFC at this current stage is still a well-oiled machine. Yeah. But it does need some updating. And I think one of the biggest problems, and I, you hit it right on the head for us as a consumer, is the last pay-per-view is UFC 293 this past weekend. Mm-hmm. And that was, I believe, 80 bucks. Right. American. So is the quality of the fight card worth paying when it's jumped up in price over the years? Right. So like I was mentioning, you're an AEW fan. You just had all in, mm-hmm. 50 bucks, all out, 50 bucks, and top of this UFC pay-per-view. So if you're a fan of both, which there certainly are fans that are MMA fans and wrestling fans, hi, you're talking, you're listening to two of them. Yeah. Can you reasonably, as a consumer, say, yeah, I can spend, you know, 180 plus dollars on three pay-per-views total no that's a hard swing even for somebody that's like got a ton of money like even i'm sitting there going could i pay it sure am i gonna be happy about it no well that's the problem that i think the ufc has to deal with in in the short term because what used to be you know the marquee matchups you're very rarely in my opinion getting the full fight card value mm-hmm. like are you getting entertaining fights sure but when we're talking star power right. to generate that right. that is something that we've talked about many times on this show when's the last time we genuinely broke down a ufc pay-per-view and went this card is loaded i want to say april yeah, it's it's been a while. It's been, it's it, been it, a while, yeah. It's not as consistent as it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the one problem that they have right now is just the star power is lacking, and then certain stars are not in great matchups. Mm-hmm. That I think, like, you take a look at this weekend, the only fight that we we're going to be talking about is the Adesanya and Strickland one. Mm-hmm. Everybody else on the card was a solid fight, Yeah, but it's not enough that we're writing home about it. Right. And I think this is something the UFC really needs to kind of take a look at WWE and see what they're doing. Now, am I saying they're going to switch that method? I wish they would, but they're not. But I think that it would be something to get more eyes on the prize, so to speak, that if you can work out a deal and do some kind of cross promotion. See, and but I'm not saying fights at the right, wrestling events. Right. No. Yeah. But I'm saying I, in terms of like switching from the pay per view method to WWE's method, I would say never say never because I can see you know Ari or or uh, Vince talking to Dana and going, Hey, listen, we know you're you're kind of nervous and trepidatious about this, but so were we when we did this. Mm-hmm. And then show him the numbers of like, Hey, this is what we were making. 
you know, the last full year they did the traditional pay-per-view method through, you know, calling through your cable provider and paying 35, 30, 50 bucks, whatever it was. Yeah. Here, this is the last fiscal year we did that method and here's mm-hmm. what we made. And then we switched over to the network method and here's what we made. And if it's more than what they were getting before, I think that can sell Dana on it. I, you know, I know Dana is a very smart businessman. So I, I would say if I have to put a percentage on it, I'll say 25% mm-hmm. just because the way I interpret it, and like I say, I could be wrong about this. Mm-hmm. The payout system for UFC is different than UFC or WWE. Yeah, it is. So they yeah. would have to restructure a lot, which is yeah. not a bad thing. <laughs> no, it's not. Just going to put that out there? No, it's not. But it just depends on what they want to do specifically. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that's an avenue that could help them. I think that they need to get more back into the public eye. Mm-hmm. I think that since they left Fox... They're still in there, but like, let's face it: when you're put on network TV for your fight cards, mm-hmm. that's a huge deal. Well, yeah, and it's kind of like they went to ESPN, and it's been like status quo ever since. Yeah, I mean, they're on there with certain fight nights, but it's usually on fight, you know, ESPN Plus as ESPN an incentive. Plus, yeah, yeah. But it's, I mean, how many times is it featured on ABC? Not on Saturday afternoon. Right. But we're talking prime time, right? You know, like that's a question you have to ask, and I think with the Endeavor deal. That is going to be something that they're going to be looking at and really saying, okay, what's worked for WWE that we can do this? Because as you see and you mentioned, they're selling out pay-per-views left and right. Mm-hmm. So if they're generating the highest buy rates, they're generating the highest attendance, mm-hmm. the merch, the whole time, everything top to bottom. UFC needs to buy into that. Yeah. And they need to do that. I, I'm not going to say quickly, but I think they do need a, a yeah. something added to them. Right. So. Right. Well, and I know some people are nervous that WWE is going to start turning into UFC in terms of advertising and stuff with all the ads you see in the UFC. And I would say probably not. I'm not going to say yeah. I'm not going to say 100 percent. No, but I'm going to say probably not just because of the way they're presented with WWE. You know, we'll, we'll keep it to television. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of commercials that take place in, you know, a WWE event, you know, so that's so you got the commercial breaks and whatever else. So you don't really need to do a ton of ads in the ring. Mm -hmm. Sure. They've started doing more with the the sponsored matches or whatever else, but eh, whatever, you know, but you know, that's why you don't see, you know, C4 plastered all over the ring now. Cause they're, they're one of the drink sponsors of WWE, whatever else. Whereas with UFC, when you, even, even if it's on ABC or ESPN or ESPN plus, you know, you can have a fight go, especially if it's the main event, five five minute rounds mm-hmm. you can you can have a fight go upwards of a half hour before you see a commercial yeah so i mean that i so i don't think we're necessarily going to see a ton of ads in the ring like w i'm not saying it won't happen but i just don't see it happening i don't see it happening either but i think that you are going to see some swift changes with the ufc mm-hmm. to what degree on the flip side though i think we will see some changes with wwe sure very minor but i think the yeah. biggest one is the big five premium live events are going to be now pay specials. Maybe. I could see it. And you know what? That's fair on a business sense. I don't think it would happen, though, until after the deal with Peacock runs out, and that isn't until, I want to say, 2026. I could be wrong. There's going to be a lot of speculation going on because with the network deal, I know that that's going to kind of start dabbling into that because we do know the television rights are going to be... The television rights are up at the end of October. I know that. Right. I know that. I'm looking up the... P- uh, ba, 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 ba. Let me see. Peacock so, expiration date. Yeah. So like I say, depending on what happens there, they could do that, but it also depends on what is going to be in, in, enrolled with that. Yeah. So according to a quick Google search, the WWE streaming re- streaming deal with Peacock do- expires in 2026. So, oh, it, so, that's a, okay. so if they do end up going that way, it won't be for another like three years. Which is good. I mean, because I think that method works. Yeah, and a, lot, oh, yeah. and a lot more fans are into it. But I would not doubt them trying to do that with some other events. Mm-hmm. And just, I'm not saying you're going to be paying eighty dollars like you are currently for the for the UFC. Mm-hmm. I think you. I would not doubt a fifty dollar one. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. But it also depends on what they want to do as a business model because now you're venturing over into a different market. Mm-hmm. And granted, there is crossover appeal. Oh, yeah. But it's not fully blown. If you're a UFC fan, you're a WWE. Right. So, I, right. so I don't think we're going to start seeing, you know, Roman Reigns or Drew McIntyre or, you know, Shanna Baszler or whatever else showing up at a UFC card or fight a UFC card. Right. And vice versa. I don't think we're going to see, you know, the Jorge Masvidal's or, you know, the Habibs or the Connors or whatever coming over for a WWE event. I don't doubt we might see some of them in the audience. 
you know, just for like a cross promotional, hey, you know, show up and we'll promote, you know, show up because we're promoting, you know, the next WWE pay-per-view events this upcoming Saturday or this next Saturday. Mm-hmm. I can see that happening. But in terms of like a Mike Tyson showing up at WrestleMania or having a match at WrestleMania type thing, no. I think if anything comes over from the UFC, and I don't think this will be, I, I don't think this will be in every uh, pay-per-view thing, but for like a WrestleMania, get Bruce Buffer to do the announcing. That'd be dope. I'd be okay with that. Listen, that this is nothing against Samantha Irvine. No, she's amazing. Who's phenomenal, and the guy who I forget the name, the guy who does it on SmackDown. You know, but like if you can get like because they're now under one roof, and Buffer's got a contract with UFC, which is now owned by the same company that owns WWE. You know, I can see them going to Buffer and saying, "Hey, same rate, we'll send you to you know Philly because it's in Philly this upcoming year." But hey, we'll have you announce, and you know, we'll have you intro the the fighters for the main event of WrestleMania both nights. Yeah, see that'd be that'd be a cool choice. Just add some star just add some star power to the, the whole show. I'll say this, if they get Dan Lambert Yo. onto WWE programming. Oh my god. Give him an open mic, put him with LA Knight, just have him go debate. Dan Lambert and LA Knight versus Paul Heyman. Oh my god, give it to me. The man did magic in AEW. Why he's not back there anymore, I don't understand. Cuz Tony Khan's the booker of the year. Yeah. But this is going to be a big move in closing. I think that this there's a lot of stuff that you're going to see moving parts happen very quickly. A lot of stuff behind the scenes that we probably won't hear about just because I well there will there be some folks let go out of their contracts? Yeah, maybe. But I think for the majority of it, you know, if there's a redundant position that is already over in one company or the other, however they determine which one to cut, which one to keep, that's where you'll see the most of it. Oh, agreed. Yeah. There was one little news bite, though, that came out of this mm-hmm. uh, post-announcement mm-hmm. that we definitely want to talk about before we head on out from the segment here. So. Yeah, so there was a number of folks in New York today at the Stock Exchange in uh, Manhattan. You know, uh, Dana White was there. Nick Khan was there. I, I, I believe I saw uh, Triple H. Paul Levesque was there. Uh, but also Nick Khan was there. And Mark Romani from ESPN tweeted out a little bit ago as we record, Uh, Quote, I asked WWE president Nick Khan today whether or not WWE would be interested in bringing back CM Punk following Mm. his firing from AEW. Khan didn't say yes nor no. This is what he responded. Quote, listen, we only have respect for Phil. We appreciate his run here. We appreciate what he did and tried to do with the UFC. Not many people can actually get in there and do what he did. So... When we have respect for Phil, we wish him nothing but the best, close quote. So the way I'm taking that is never say never. Never say never, but I'm also, it sounded like they're not. Committed. More leaning no at this point. They're more leaning no. Yeah. Because I feel like if he if they were in talks or, because we still don't know if he's got a no compete or whatever else mm-hmm. is involved with his release from uh, AEW. If they were in discussions and if they were in talks to bring him in, there'd be more of a no comment on this. Well, yeah, that's what I think. And plus, they don't want to tip their hand. No. I mean, that's Nick Khan, love him or hate him, is a very, very smart businessman. Mm-hmm. Well, and at this point, because the deal's officially done, the decision on whether he comes back or not is not going to come from Triple H. It's not going to come from Nick Khan. It's going to come from Ari Emanuel. Mm-hmm. So it just depends on what they want to do exactly. Like, could that move the needle if they really want to cause a spark? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it'll move the needle. That's for goddamn sure. Yeah, so it just depends on how aggressive they want to get. But this is going to be a company that is going to be looking for that kind of spark. Mm -hmm. Now, am I saying he's coming? No. I mean, there's no way. At this stage, I'm saying not right now. But I would say as the deal starts moving forward, as it's now done, Mm -hmm. you are going to see them get very aggressive. And you are going to see WWE pop up in a lot of places it hasn't before. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the same thing for the UFC. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very telling sign about how business is going to be for both Mm -hmm. MMA and pro wrestling moving forward. Mm -hmm. Because this is the two biggest organizations in that genre. Mm -hmm. So now seeing them working under the same banner. And this is not anything that's going to be, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. Right. They're looking to make an investment into the future of both sports and entertainment and really take it to the next level. And some people are really going to be shocked by what they're going to do. Oh, yeah. 
So yeah. we're going to tell everybody brace right now. I would just say don't expect anything crazy for maybe a couple of weeks. Just because oh, for a few months, a couple weeks, few months, because when you have these two co- companies of this size coming together, where the valuation is now over twenty billion dollars, this isn't a we're going to hit the ground running and start making changes. You know, twenty four hours from now, that like will they do some stuff? Yes, but will it be monumental and ground shaking and and landscape changing? Not really. Eventually, yes, but they got to get some stuff figured out. The first big move you'll see is around WrestleMania next year. Probably, yeah. So that's a good six months out. Because you got to figure they've got all the stuff for the rest of the year planned out, signed deal. Hell, I wouldn't even be surprised if they start pitching to cities, having them both in the same city in one weekend. If I, if, if, if if for one weekend you move WWE back to Sunday, because Lord knows you'll never move UFC to a Sunday. But if you say, hey, uh, pick a city, Los Angeles, what well, Los Angeles will say. Say, hey, you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get a UFC pay-per-view on saturday from staple center mm-hmm. i know it's the crypto.com arena but staple center yeah right, i get you and then wrestlemania at sofi just as an example i wouldn't doubt them trying that in the future they could go a friday saturday sunday night if they really yeah. wanted to do something yeah. crazy that's the one thing that with the powers to be that are involved like these are very aggressive business people there's a lot of heavy hitters there mm-hmm. and they're not going to be shy about staking their claim about being number one and if you're competition this is something to truly be worried about. This is a bear you don't want to poke. Mm-hmm. So consider yourselves fair warned if you're the opposition, but Endeavor TKO is here. Uh-huh. Let's talk about it, ODPH Society. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH pod. What is your feelings about the big merger? UFC, WWE, under one roof. Talk to us. Let us know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Alan Dunford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, Pad. What you got? Got a couple of things to talk about. First of which is obviously the local minute. We got to give a little bit of congratulations because the Binghamton Rumble Ponies have officially clinched a playoff spot in the 2023 Eastern League playoffs. Uh, this is their 11th playoff appearance in franchise history and their first since 2017. Uh, so reading from the uh, article on their Rumble Ponies official website, it says, quote, uh, with the cancellation of Sunday's Portland Reading game, uh, the Binghamton Rumble Ponies have officially clinched a playoff berth in the 2023 Eastern League playoffs. It is the 11th playoff appearance in franchise history and first since 2017. Binghamton has won three Eastern League championships in its history, uh, 1992, 1994, in 2014 fans can purchase playoff tickets online uh online and by calling 607-722-3866 or in person at the visions federal credit union starting gate box office at Morabito stadium uh the rumble ponies who be- will begin the postseason next tuesday september 19th at Morabito stadium against the Somerset Patriots, Ooh. the New York Yankees Double A affiliate. Let's go. Uh, so the full playoff schedule is as follows: uh, Tuesday, September nineteenth, as uh, the Patriots at the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. That will start at six thirty-five p.m. Eastern. Thursday, September twenty-first, the will be the Binghamton Rumble Ponies at the Somerset Patriots. That'll be at TD Bank Ballpark. That'll be at six thirty-five p.m. Eastern. And then game three, uh, which will be Friday, September 22nd. That will be the Rumble Ponies at the Somerset Patriots and TD Bank Ballpark, 6.35 p.m. That will be if necessary. Uh, and then if they, and then you have the Eastern League Championship Series will be the, uh, the Eastern League Championship Series will be Sunday, September 24th. That will be the Southwest Division Champion at the Binghamton Rumble Ponies at Morabito Stadium at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. I'm guessing all of these are in case they miss it because I'm not really sure why the Rumble Ponies are listed here, but hey, I'm rolling with it. <laughs> uh, then the Tuesday, September 26th, will be the Binghamton Rumble Ponies at the Southwest Division Champions. That time will be to be determined. And then Wednesday, uh, September 27th, will be the Rumble Ponies at the Southwest Division Champions, and that time is to be determined and if necessary. Uh, looking at their schedule from this past week, uh, they were on the road playing the Hartford Yard Goats. They uh, they lost the game on Tuesday, the fifth, by the final score of six to one. Came back on Wednesday, won by the final score of nine to two. 
they had a doubleheader on Thursday where they won the first game by the final score of 2 to nothing, and then lost on the second game by the final score of 9-5. to uh, The Friday game was uh, suspended and was to be made up on Sunday, so I'll get to that in a minute. The game on Saturday was canceled because of rain. Uh, and then the Sunday, they got one game in. Uh, be, and then uh, where they won 10 to nothing, and then they didn't get the second game in again because of rain. Uh, so looking ahead to their schedule, they have this upcoming week. They're at home playing the Reading Fight and Fills. Uh, they have a game on Tuesday, the August the 12th, or September the 12th, excuse me, uh, where their uh, start time is 6.35 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Wednesday the 13th is also at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Thursday is also at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. Friday is at 7.05 p.m. Eastern. Saturday is at 6.07 p.m. Eastern because it is 6.07 Saturdays. And then Sunday is at 1.05 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for more tickets, information, and all that good stuff, uh, bingrp.com. Playoffs? Yeah. We're talking playoffs. We're talking playoffs. Let's go. Yeah. Shout out to the Rumble Ponies. Yeah. Uh, and then we got to talk a little bit of NBA because you had a – a little bit of interesting news come out the other day. Oh. Uh, so you had Team USA Basketball, I believe it was in the FIBA World Cup, uh, where uh, there was some tournament where they lost to Canada in the gold medal, or not the gold medal game, the bronze medal game. Mm -hmm. They didn't win. Uh, you know, the team wasn't that good offensively, I would say. They, you know, didn't didn't win all that well. Uh, apparently it ruffled some feathers though, because it sounds like we're trying to get there. Uh, some folks are trying to get the redeem team 2.0 together here. Uh, so reading from an article from Brian Windhorst on ESPN.com, it says, quote, there is robust interest from NBA superstars, including past gold medal winners, LeBron James and Anthony Davis to join USA basketball for the 2024 Paris games with Steph, Stephen Curry also pondering an Olympic debut sources told ESPN. Curry has expressed interest to play for Steve Kerr, his Golden State Warriors coach, sources told ESPN. Several players who were part of the 2021 gold medal winning team in Tokyo who didn't play in the FIBA World Cup this summer, including Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, and two-time gold medalist Draymond Green are also candidates to return, sources told ESPN. Chris Paul, who won gold, Olympic gold medals in 2008 and 2012, is also considering another Olympic run, sources told ESPN's, ESPN's Dave McMenamin. Uh, Kevin Durant has won three Olympic gold medals and would be a candidate to play again. Team USA has done some recruiting of Joel Embiid, who holds both United States and French, French citizenship, but the Philadelphia 76ers star has thus far been noncommittal. Health will obviously play a large role in how these teams comes together. James, Davis, and Embiid have all battled various injuries at the end of recent seasons. James, th uh, 38 years old, won a bronze in 2004 and golds in 28, 2008 and 2012. Davis won gold in 2012 and was part of the World Cup winner when he last played for Team USA in 2014. Uh, the past three major international basketball tournaments have been in Asia, and scheduling changes and COVID have made getting commitments from superstar players challenging for Team USA. Uh, USA Basketball Executive Director Grant Hill has said playing in this year's World Cup was not, uh, was not a requirement to be considered for the Olympic team. The U.S. has won the past four Olympic golds in basketball, but just two of the past six World Cups. Uh, team USA failed to medal at the World Cup in Manila. Close quote. So, uh, sounds like we might be getting redeemed Team 2.0 here. I'm all right with this. Yeah. You know, if he wants to lead the charge for it, I think there's no better leader right now. Mm -hmm. And if he can get those guys motivated. Yeah. That will be scary. Yeah. And especially, That's you know, a scary team. I mean, let's face it. LeBron's getting near the end. Yeah. What better way to go out than win one for USA? Absolutely. You know, he play, may plays maybe one more year, you know, and then goes out and wins the gold medal. Hey, that's a hell of a way to go out. That's better than going out and winning the NBA championship in your final year. Exactly. Just putting it out there. So we'll have to wait and see about that. I, I also just think it's funny when you look back at that, like, starting five for the redeem team where it was, like, LeBron, Kobe, uh, what was it? Uh, and then uh, Dwayne. Dwayne Wade was there and Carmelo was there. That like The fact that other teams put out their starting five and thought they had a shot, yeah, hysterical. Well, you know, I, I will say this. I love the fact that they got motivated by this, that this sparked it. In mm -hmm. You know, like I say, because a lot of times when you achieve that level of success, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about doing that extra uh, attempt, especially yeah. after you've already won, it's not really there. I love seeing this out of them. And if you don't know anything or a lot about the Redeem team from USA Basketball, check out the documentary on Netflix. Highly recommend that. Absolutely. So before we get out of here, there is one more UFC note I want to talk about, and I don't want to speculate a lot on this, but 
there was a huge upset this weekend. UFC 293 from mm, Sydney mm-hmm. happened, and Israel Adesanya was facing Sean Strickland. And Strickland pulled off the big upset and won via unanimous decision mm-hmm. over Adesanya, 49-46 from all three judges. He knocked him down in the first round and almost finished him. Like, this is crazy to me. Yeah. Sean Strickland is a, one of the UFC's most, I will say, polarizing fighters. Mm-hmm. Um, he is very who he is. Mm-hmm. Like I say, if you ever hear him in interviews, he is like there is nothing held back. There is no filter. No. He is who he is. Uh, some people love him. Some people hate him. But he went in there and just put on a performance of a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And now defeating Adesanya, who... It's going to be interesting to see where he goes from here because Adesanya just lost to Perea not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And now with Strickland being at the top of the middleweight division, Adesanya is at this very interesting point in his career, as weird as that sounds. Mm -hmm. But I know the talk is giving him an automatic rematch, but... I mean, he is currently the number one number one ranked fighter uh, in the middleweight division on UFC.com slash rankings. Mm-hmm. But uh, Driscus Duplessis is number two, Robert Whitaker, number three, Jared Canignier, number four, and then Marvin Vittori is number five. So it's a really interesting point of where we go from here for both. Because mm-hmm. Sean Strickland is not exactly... I mean, he jumped from number five up to this title shot. Mm-hmm. And I think it was it was more or less by default, right. if I'm not mistaken. Like I say, he was not somebody that was in that discussion. He just lost to Perea not too long prior. And to I mean to see where his rank, you know, his his fight record is. I know you're calling it up right now. It's very interesting to see the jump. Mm-hmm. And then now is the division wide open, and that's kind of where you have to sit there and go. Maybe it is. So looking at Sean Strickland's record in 33 professional matches, he has a record of 28 wins, five losses, uh, currently on a three-fight winning streak, uh, defeating Israel Adesanya, obviously, in this most recent fight. Then he beat a gentleman by the name of Aspuyan uh, Magmedov uh, via TKO. That was back in July. Uh, and then it was a unanimous decision win against uh, Nusardine Imavov by unanimous decision. That was back in January. His last loss was to Jared Canier. That was a split decision loss. That was back in December. And then the one before that, I believe, was Pereira. Pereira, which he got knocked out in the first round. That yeah. was back in July of last year. So it's a great upset. Mm-hmm. But... This also leaves that division very, very up in the air. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, where does everybody go from here? I mean, to think Adesanya, you almost have to think that he has to take a look at going up to 205 and staying there. Just remember, you can go up to 205. You don't have to stay at 170. Right. Or 185. (laughs) 185, yeah. But that's that's the one thing, because I know that he might have to, but... You also have the division that's kind of really up in the air because plus, just like you talked about, a name that's getting yeah, a lot of name, yeah. a lot of heat right now. Yeah, Chemayev, who knows? Also, uh, Israel, remember, just because you weigh two hundred five doesn't and come in two hundred five doesn't mean you have to stay at two hundred five. Because the last time you went to two hundred five, you came in at weight, and your opponent added something like thirty or forty pounds. Yeah, no, he was underweight. Yeah, no, he, no, yeah, that's right. He was under the weight limit. His opponent weighed in. At the official weigh-ins at 205, and then before the fight started, added like 30, 40 pounds. Yeah, Blahovitz was huge. Blaho- on yeah, so Blahovitz had like a 40-pound fight, 40 uh, pound weight difference. Yeah, so like I say, because other than that, I mean, I don't think there's any other big names in that you know that top five you talked about, because he lost to Kanye, and then, I mean, you know, looking at the rankings. Uh, let's see. I'm, oh, I'm pulling up uh, Adesanya's record here. Yeah. Uh, he's beaten Canyonye once. He's beaten. He's one and one against Pereira. Uh, let's see. Let's flip back and forth between the two. Duplessis. Yeah, I mean, you got a matchup there. He hasn't faced Duplessis before. Mm-hmm. Whitaker. He's beaten Whitaker twice. Yeah. From what I can see. Canyonye, I mentioned Vittori. Uh, he's beaten Vittori. Uh, that was a unanimous decision. Went back in 2021. Uh, hell, we even go to six. Six is Paulo Costa. Yep, beat him. Uh, seven is Ramon uh, Dolidez, D-O-L-I-D-Z-E. 
Oh, uh, don't see that there. Although I don't see the number one fighting the number seven. Right. So, but, I mean, the top six, there's some matchups there you can do. There is some, like I say. And I always throw Chemayev's name in there because, I mean, I know he's supposed to be fighting Paulo Costa. Mm-hmm. You know, last I heard, that fight is still on. Mm-hmm. Reasons why I would think not, but I'm just saying. Yeah. But I think in this situation, you got to take a look at Strickland. Like, okay, so Strickland's wide open, but then again, Kanye beat him, Perea beat him. It's tough to give him a fight other than Duplessis. I think that that's the fight you got to make. Mm-hmm. But for Adesanya, this is wide open. Yeah. Like, I don't. You could get the automatic rematch, sure, and then you win, and then what do you do? Trilogy? I mean, like that. That's the problem you have right now. And we talked about this a little bit with the UFC earlier when we were talking about the Endeavor deal. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a big lack of star power, and there's a a real big lack of like who's next. Yeah. And this division, Adesanya cleaned out. Mm-hmm. So it's either you stay the king of 185 or you move up. And just remember, you can go up to 205. Yeah. And and that's something he's going to have to really consider. I mean, I don't know where everything goes for him because I could see him wanting to get back in the cage. But this might be a situation where, you know, some time off mm-hmm. might be a good thing, at least for the UFC, like to reassess. Yeah, I, th- I think that's what he's going to do. I Because, th- I mean, Dana, I know Dana was talking to me in a rematch, but I'm like, I would pump brakes. I mean, as great as Adesanya is, he's one of your biggest stars. Overall, for your division's future, like you have to start thinking about that. Right. Well, and I know, like, okay, immediate rematch. Okay, sure. But, like, I was looking at the scorecard. It's not anything that, like, oh, it was controversial. Oh, it was, oh, you need to do an immediate rematch because, uh, well, you know, whatever else. He got no, dominated. He, he got dominated. I mean, the UFC.com provides the official scorecards on their site if you just search U, uh, UFC, the event, and then scorecards. All three judges, scored, like you mentioned, scored the fight 49-46. All three judges gave the first round to Strickland. All three judges gave the second round to Adesanya. All three judges gave rounds three, four, and five to Strickland. Mm. Like, there's there's not any, like, oh, you had two judges look at it this way, or you had one judge look at it that way. No, it's all, they all saw the same fight, and they all called it the same way. Yeah. So that's why I say, like, if he if he takes some time, because, I mean, you take a look at how long he's been fighting, too, back mm-hmm. consecutively. Yeah. That's a, I'm not saying he's Cerrone level, but it's close. he fights very frequently. There is something to be said about exhaustion from yeah, the cage. Yeah. And that might be something he really needs to look at. So kudos to Sean Strickland pulled off the biggest upset. He was a plus five hundred going into this yeah, fight. So yeah. and like I say, I think the Duplicis fight is the only fight you can make with him right now. Mm-hmm. And like I say, if they go automatic rematch, that's one thing, but I don't know. I'm looking at I'm looking at out of sign It looks like his longest layoff was from his first fight to his second fight. His very first fight was for a Supremacy Fighting Championship Federation, uh, which his first fight was on the 24th of March, 2012. His next fight was for a federation called Shuriken MMA, uh, Best of the Best. That was on the 15th of June, 2013. And then, yeah. he, and then he had a layoff where he went to the Legend of Ime, uh, which that his third fight was on the 8th of August, 2015. He's then been fighting consistently. And has not missed any significant time off since 2015. Yeah, I'm definitely thinking he needs to pump some brakes. I wouldn't blame him. Yeah, like I said, if he takes time to reassess, like there's no shame in it, yeah. and it's it, this isn't like a fight with Perea where it was too personal, right? Like this was just a complete random, you know, loss. I mean, it's so a, it's, it's it's an upset. It's why we say never leave it in the judges' hands. Yep, and that's the thing. Like he's, he's lucky he didn't get finished in the first round. Yeah, that's true. Strickland landed one of the cleanest rights I've seen in a fight mm-hmm. and took and knocked him down. So we'll have to wait and see what happens from here. But like that was the only real takeaway I had from UFC 293. Like I know there's a lot of nonsense about the the pre fight presser. Mm. I don't even care about it. Like it was just it was nonsense. Okay. It was it was just in my opinion, I think it was just we're trying to sell the fight. And yeah. you know what? I still didn't care because it was an okay fight card, but right. the main event, I honestly thought Izzy was gonna take him second round, but mm-hmm. You know, like I say, you never know what's going to happen in the cage. That's why you should always watch the fights or at least listen to the OD Page podcast. We'll make sure we recap that for you and give you our thoughts on that. That being said, for anything and everything, it is the OD Page. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for this week. So for the one and only Padawan J, fuck the Astros. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the OD Page podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Down to the punch. I'm gonna be down to the
punch Cause I can't bring 